we're going to implement uh, the X APIC structure. Well, here's the local APIC. Um, so a zero. So this is a uh, local APIC. Um, this will say memory affinity. Memory is enabled. And then local APIC. And then we'll assert that the length is equal to a 16. Invalid APIC SRA entry. Okay. We'll get the domain. We'll say extract the fields you care about. I do like that message. That's good. Uh, this is SRA plus two to get the domain. Oh, this is the domain low. Fuck this. Um, what a stupid structure. Domain high, U8 for three? Fuck off. MM read fizz. Fizz adder SRA.0 plus. This is at nine. Domain low and high, and then we have the, um... Fuck, it's so stupid, man. <laughs> uh, and then we're gonna get the uh, APIC ID, the U8, MM, read, fizz, fizz, adder, SRA.0 plus three. And flags, do we care about flags? Enabled. If clear, ignore this entry. It allows it to populate a static number, but enable them as necessary. Oh, so we will need that. Um, flags, E32 is memem read fizz fizz adder SRA.0 plus. Flags are at four. Two, two, nine, three, four is all we care about. Looks like it. Um, if uh, this is a log the affinity record. Okay, we'll pull out this. And this we'll put up here. This is the, um, uh, we'll say flags. The entry is uh, enabled and present. Uh, apparent, um, some BIOSes may statically, uh, allocate these table regions, thus the flags indicate whether the entry is actually present or not. Flags enabled. Flags enabled. Log the affinity record, and then in this case we're going to assert that the uh, APIC affinities dot insert um, APIC ID as U32 maps to a domain. Uh, assert that that's none, meaning we didn't override an entry uh, in the table. And then here we're going to do let domain is equal to um, domain high um, let's see is there a better way for me to do this uh, domain high zero one two Domain low. Okay, there isn't. Thanks, Desu. I know that when you say that, that I can actually trust it. <laughs> uh, let domain is equal to u32 from Ellie bytes domain. Parse the uh, domain low and high parts into an actual u32.
You can initialize them and read them in parts. Yeah, I was thinking that. I, I, I'm fine with this in this case. Uh, let's try this. Okay, let's go into our advanced memory configuration, uh, SNC4, and then memory mode, we're gonna go into um, flat mode. So in cache mode, so the Xeon Phi has, um, the Xeon Phi has 16 gigs of uh, high bandwidth DDR on die, this MCD RAM here, um, the 16 gigs of MCD RAM. Now, SNC4 means I'm in a uh, sub NUMA clustering four mode, which means that uh, the, the processors will all cluster into their like best locations. So SNC4 is the best mode for clustering uh, given the OS is aware of it. If it's not something like all to all is really good because uh, that kind of interleaves and mixes all the uh, clustering and routing together. But since we're aware of the routing and NUMA nodes, uh, we can do that. So in cache memory mode, the processor will actually use the 16 gigs of MCD RAM as cache. Uh, in flat mode, it will use the MCD RAM as um, separate. So you can, the OS, if aware, uh, can explicitly address the MCD RAM. So you can do NUMA allocations out of the MCD RAM region. And then a hybrid, I think, uh, is a 50-50. Uh, it splits it in two, um, but anyways, we want the uh, we want to use flat mode, and this will cause us to get more entries on our. Um, let's see, uh, save and exit. This is going to cause us to get more entries on that table, and this will be a much more exotic configuration. So I think this will be a, a good representation of what we might end up seeing in a weird piece of hardware. 16 gigs of cache, how fast that DRAM? It's about 450 megabyte, uh, gigabytes per second of, of uh, throughput, but it has higher latency than normal DRAM. So the latency is higher, but the uh, throughput is also is significantly higher. For example, uh, DRAM typically on a high-end Xeon server is, well, it used to be about 90 gigs a second, and now on modern stuff, I think 115 gigs a second are what the high-end, bleeding-edge uh, Xeon processors run for memory bandwidth. And that's going to be with uh, many different, uh, let's see, I think I hit, yes. Yeah, I can hear it. It's rebooting. So, so that'll come online, and that will have a, um, I think that's going to hit a panic because it's going to define two regions uh, for the same domain. And that's exactly what I want to... Actually, it's going to make more domains. Yeah, it's going to make more domains. Um, but this one might fail. I think we're going to have more affinity entries. Okay, so let's take a look at... Uh, that's going to get us the local APIC entry, and then we're going to have another one of these bad boys... This is going to be for the X2 APIC, wherever that is. It's going to look basically the same. This is an entry 2. This is X2 APIC. Invalid. Oh, we're modifying the wrong one. Uh, 2. Uh, X2 APIC. Invalid X2 APIC. SRA entry. We care about the APIC ID. This is going to be a U32 now. And that's going to be at 8. Then we have a proximity domain, the domain. This is at four, and then the flags are at 12. Okay, so then we're going to update that and let's make sure the flags are the same. They're identical to the APIC, SAPIC. Okay. So now, uh, it looks like this is online. It is. Invalid X2 APIC SRA entry. Uh, that's because I didn't update the length to say 24. Okay, so this is on our VM. This is on our Lenovo. And this is on the Xeon Phi. So in this case, we have, now we have eight different regions. And they map the different parts. And in this case, I think, uh, yeah, so these, you can see, 
these four different ranges, they're exactly, um, they're exactly four gigs each. And that totals up to 16 gigs. This is the MCD RAM right here. So this is telling me that if I access physical address from here to here, this is where the MCD RAM is mapped into physical memory space. And then this is the rest of DRAM. Um, isn't that fucking cool? X2 APIC ID is eight bytes long? No, that's the byte offset. It is weird that it's length offset. I normally think offset length. I'm, w I'm with you there. Uh, and then in this case, uh, we're just gonna do this. Okay, so we are able to map this system out and we have those heavy assertions. So I'm gonna do um, uh, duplicate, uh, or here we're gonna say um, multiple APIC domains, uh, multiple APIC, uh, uh, proximity domains, and then this will say um, duplicate uh, memory affinity domain, and this will say uh, uh, duplicate uh, local APIC um, affinity domain, and this will say duplicate affinity domain. So I think if we're passing on the Xeon Phi, I probably don't need to relax those to take vectors. Now what we can do is we can print the APIC affinities. And this will show you what APICs go to what regions. You know, I feel like there should be duplicates here. Yeah, um, you could also check for intersecting memory domains. Yeah, um, well, actually, we will do that uh, in actually a couple minutes here because I think we have everything that I care about. What's interesting is that this doesn't actually map to these larger domains. And I, I think that makes sense then because it's up to the OS to know that these are special. There's no way that an OS can know generically that this is faster than this. That's just not information that's present. So I think by default, you get access to RAM and then the MCD RAM is, um, the MCD RAM is something you opt into. So now this is showing that these APICs route to this these APICs route to this, so on and so forth. And this is telling me if I'm on this APIC, I should use this memory region, which means I can go up to this table and look at this, and I should prefer allocating out of this region because this region of memory is the most local to my core. And I'll show you the, the difference in performance between these. Um, in fact, uh, I'm gonna save these out. We're gonna return out the APIC affinities and the memory affinities. We'll turn out those structures. Um, and then this returns uh, B tree map U32, U32. And I think we'll go like this. And then we got a B tree map to a, uh, a U32 fizz adder U64. And I maybe should put these in structures, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, so we'll say uh, returns a tuple of APIC to, um, APIC to proximity affinity, uh, APIC to proximity, uh, to, we'll say APIC to domain and then um, memory domain to uh, physical address size, right? Okay, so then here we can do, we'll parse out all this information and then here we're parsing the tables here. We'll do let me memory affinities Uh, we'll say memory domains. 
is uh, none let mute. So we have got we've got memory domains. We've got apic domains, and we've got apix. Um, uh, set up the set up the structures we're interested as parsing out as none as some of them may or may not be present. So then here when we parse this, this will be apix is equal to this. And then we'll assert apix is none uh, multiple apic uh, ACPI table entries. We'll say multiple uh, MADD, MADT entries. And then here we'll say assert that APIC domains and memory domains are none. And memory domains is none. Multiple SRAT ACPI table entries. And I think I have seen this on real hardware. So uh, we will probably eventually hit that assertion, but we can relax that assertion and then merge the tables together uh, when that day comes. But I do like failing closed uh, until I see evidence to the contrary so I understand a little bit better what's going on. So in this case, that's going to return a sum. In this case, we're going to do... Uh, how the fuck do you do this? Can you do this? You can, I think. Oh, but, um. Oh, you can't. Huh. Is this project for education only, or do you plan on using it for fuzzing? I plan to use this for fuzzing. Um. Let's. AD. MD is equal to this. APIC domains is equal to sum 80. Memory domains is sum MD. So we'll set those up. And now we've parsed out all that information. Let's see how it works on our set. OK, works on all of these. No assertions. Everything is working as expected. OK, so now what this means is um, There's a reason you can't do destructuring without let, and I don't remember exactly why. Oh, interesting. Sad day. All right, let's take a look at header. Oh, we're ignoring the header on both of these. Oh, bird's flying in my window again. <laughs> that silly bird, man. Okay, we'll parse the MADT. Parse out those things. You know, this code is actually decent quality. I think I wrote this pretty well for shot. Um, we got good comments on everything, on all the structures, all of the things when we're parsing, creating everything. Uh, good, good names, good assertions, good bound checks. Uh, that's that's going to be Apex. This is going to return a vector of apix uh, returns a vector of all uh, usable apic IDs. Okay. All right. Great. So we parse those things out. And now what I want to do is I want to make affinity structures. Yeah. We're going to go into... Um, I might want to do this pre-core. Well, I can't allocate pre-core. Prior to having core, I can't allocate. Um, what's the best way for me to do this? So I need to get my, my current APIC ID. I don't remap my APIC ID, so I want to get my APIC ID 
and then I want to update my core structures with my routing information. And then I also want to update the memory manager. I want to inform the memory manager of the regions of memory. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, for apic in apix, print apic, uh, we'll just do like 04. This maps to um, pound 018x, pound 018x. And here we're going to do apic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Memory. Uh, we'll do this. Memory domains. This is going to be invalid on the other course. This is just for testing. Uh, memory domains dot as ref dot unwrap. We're going to get the apic. What is this? Apic domains as ref unwrap apic. Uh, let mem is equal to this. It's just for testing. We're just testing. This code's gonna go in the trash. Don't worry. Don't worry. Apic mem.0 mem.1 son of a bitch uh apic oh uh on wrap ref that ref that and here we go on the fly so this is telling me for each of the apix, um, I don't know why I lost a space on one of those. This is telling me for each of the apix where uh, the best memory is for that core, for that, uh, for that apix. Isn't that cool? Isn't that nifty? Isn't that nifty? Um. Okay. How do you get it to soft reboot? Um, did I do soft reboot yesterday or today? Um, I forget when I did soft reboot, but we, I think, yeah, soft reboot we finished yesterday. It was kind of broken. Today we actually really polished our locking subsystem. Um, we still have to clean up a lot of that code. But, yeah, we, we made our locks really, really good today. Like, exceptionally good. Our, our locks are so fucking good now. Uh, we basically either will detect deadlocks instantaneously, or we will prevent any deadlocks from occurring. Deadlocks can only occur due to complete, like, single-threaded in-function binding the same lock to a variable. It's really cool. Uh, the, locking, the locking subsystem we implemented for this is... Un fucking real. Okay, so we have these regions, and now I need to. I can return out the apex, which is easy. That'll allow me to boot the other apex. That's super easy. I also need to. Um... The complex part is I need to determine how to. Um... Hmm. Yeah. I need to figure out how the parse the srat, parse that, epic there. Hmm. The memory manager needs to know of these regions. So I think what I want to do is. At this stage, I'm still single core, so I should be able to change the behavior of the 
a memory manager at this state. And I think what I'll do is, if I have these regions, if I've been given memory domains and APIC domains, um, I want to set up those domain numbers. And all I need to do is I need to be able to take an APIC ID. Hmm. So I think we're going to make a couple range sets is what we're going to do. Uh, I know what memory is free, right? I know what memory on this system is free. Uh, what can I do here? Um, what is the purpose of this OS besides being quiet? Um, being quiet is one of the largest parts of it. Another part that's going to be really fun is just the working on it, writing a new Rust kernel. I like to have kernels around for random low-level development, uh, but we're also going to use this for running hypervisor, I guess, for fuzzing targets, which is uh, the like rapid testing of software to find security bugs. So this will be largely used to find security bugs and to uh, understand how processors work better. Um, those are kind of my two main research uh, fields. So basically, this whole thing is for research. It, it's just to have a um, to have a playground around to do uh, research at a very, very, very low level. Okay, so the memory manager currently, and let's take a look. Uh, free memory. Free fizz. Wait. Uh, pop, that's for getting bulk memory. This is for getting that, and that's for getting that. Okay, so all of these places need to change. So basically, everywhere that I do one of these, I need to change. Uh, and we will potentially switch into a different mode. So I think what I'm going to do... I think I need to use free memory in conjunction with it. Which is really interesting. So the the free memory tells me all of the memory that's free on the system. When I do a NUMA allocation, I also need to remove that from free memory. Um, because the BIOS is using free memory. This is actually going to be we really weird. I'm used to the BIOS handing off memory control to the kernel. But in this case, both the BIOS... Or, uh, I'm used to the bootloader giving memory control to the kernel. And in this case, the uh, bootloader and the kernel will both be using the same memory tables. And thus, what I need to do is if I want to use uh, NUMA ranges, I think what I might do is I might implement an ALEC NUMA on the free memory range set that will prioritize allocating out of those regions if those regions exist. So let's uh, let's go look at range set and see how we'd implement that. Kernel source alloc, uh, actually uh, shared source, um, shared range set source lib. Okay, so this is where our core allocator is, and this is just finding regions of memory that satisfy an alignment requirements out of a range set. And we might run into issues where the range set starts having um, we're start having too bad of fragmentation issues. So we might need to up the number of entries that we have in the range sets. That was giving us stack issues. Um, but we can actually put that in a global if we uh, yeah, we can make it work. We can make it work where it can initialize um, from zeroing memory. Maybe. Not in a const fn, I don't think. I don't think Rust allows zeroed in a const fn, does it? Um, pub unsafe is not const. Let's see if this one zeroed uninit a promotable constant equivalent to uninit okay is uninit const yes so we can make something that's uninitialized and then we can 
zero it out. And that's not const. In interesting. Anyways, uh, we can potentially just add more ranges to this range set if needed. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to change allocate here. This is going to be the allocate size bytes for this. And this is going to be allocate uh, prefer. Uh, allocate size bytes with memory and align requirement for alignment. Um, preferring to allocate out of the region uh, preferring to allocate preferring to allocate from the region of but uh, from the region if an allocation cannot be satisfied satisfied from region the allocation will simply come from um, will will come from uh, whatever is next best. <laughs> okay. So this doesn't allow tiered NUMA stuff, but this is going to take a region here, which is going to be a range. So now what we're going to do is this allocates is going to do self dot allocates prefer size align reg uh, range start is zero end is not zero right uh, allocates anywhere from uh, the range set so range set is uh, a library that holds a it allows us to track uh, different non-contiguous chunks of 64-bit integers so it's basically uh, different ranges of integers in a set uh, where they're all exclusive and we make sure that they're not touching, they're not overlapping at all. So now what we're going to do is we have to make alloc prefer work. And I think what I'm going to do is if the allocation is here, um, how am I going to implement this? I feel like this is relatively difficult because I need to potentially fragment memory. Right? Um, no, not necessarily. So, compute the base and end of an allocation as an inclusive range. So typically we're allocating 4K. So think that we're coming through here with a line of 4K and a size of 4K. So you come through, you make sure it's addressable in the current processor state, make sure that there is enough room to satisfy the allocation. So at this state, we have found a region that can hold this allocation. Uh, self entries first, that, and intersect range size greater than requested. What? First and intersect range size is greater than requested. I see. Um, you don't mean that literally. You mean that as pseudocode, right? Because I, I don't think that's a. I can't just do that, can I? I don't think so. Because at this point, yeah, OK, sweet, OK. So uh, at this stage, we know that this base to end can satisfy the allocation. Now what we're going to do is we're going to say, uh, oh, that base end, that's the end, checked out a line fix. Oh, that's assuming that we allocate from here. Go through the entries, get the start, get the base, add the alignment fix. Then we're going to see if that fits in this region. If it does fit in this region, then we know that this range, this entry, 
can satisfy the allocation. Then what we're going to do is if, I think I have overlaps, contains. Wait, do I want contains or overlap? Um, if the entirety of x1, x2 is contained inside y1, y2. OK, so if contains ent.start, ent.end, if this entry is fully contained inside of, um, I want if any, uh, so this is not quite right, but uh, ballpark. Um, this will be uh, region start region dot end. So this is saying if the entry is entirely contained in the region, which is not true, uh, we don't really want that, right? Because this would say, let's say this is all of memory is in this region, or all of memory is in this entry. And this would basically say, oh, it is not contained. So what I need to be able to do is I need to be able to say, is there any location in which this um, overlaps? That returns if they have any overlap. Can I have this return how much overlap they have? Yeah, I want overlaps. Yeah, the intersect size, that's what I want. So how do I change this? Uh, this is making sure that they're in order. And then this checks if there's overlap. And if there's overlap, I want to, um, if there is overlap, returns the uh, amount of overlap So this will be an option, U64. And yeah, I do want left, right, don't I? Um, and these are the left, right. So if there's overlap, Otherwise, there's none. In this case, it'll be sum. Um, at this point, we know that there's overlap. We know that x2 is greater than x1. Thus, oh, I hate this logic, man. This, this is what scares me so much, because I do off by ones and shit here so easily. Uh, we know that x2. The x1 and x2 x1 and x2, so x1 is less than x2. So we know that the I guess I can do x2 minus x1 here, and then y2 minus y1. I see what you're saying, left, right, x2, y1. Yeah, just x2, y1. I, I see what you're saying. I was thinking the sizes, and this will give the um, returns the uh, left, right. And then, then in this case, this will return x2 is where the overlap starts, and y1 is where the overlap ends, correct? And then the size of the overlap is the size of the overlap is y1 minus x2 plus 1. Right? Yeah, and I'm going to say this returns the uh, left. This is the, we'll say start of overlap and end of overlap. Right? Thank you for helping me with that. This is this is really rough for me. Thanks to all y'all. Um, Seventy-eight. If it does not overlap, 
Okay, if this is none. Um, if this is none, duh. If there's no overlap, okay, so now, uh, yeah, the size of that range, since it is inclusive, start of overlap, end of overlap, um, You sure it's not y1, x2? Um, so x2 is, is it y1, x2? Um, x1, x2, the overlap. It's, yeah, it is y1, x2. It's y1, x2. Thanks, Rob Moore. y1, x2, uh, x2. Right, and then we can just, uh, we can just, I'm gonna do this for future self. Good morning from the 17th of April. How are you doing? <clears throat> so in this case, this is x1, x2, y1, y2, um, in this overlap, returns, this range, y1, to this, right, couldn't y1 be less than x1 potentially, um, if there is not overlap, then that will not be the case, couldn't, couldn't y1 be less than x1? If y1 is less than x1, oh yeah, wait. If y1 is less, less than x1, so it does vary. It's min, wait, it's, it's max. Is it max? I mean, it, it varies based on the sets, right? X1, X2 are starts, Y1, Y2 are ends. Um, oh yeah, my, docu my documentation is uh, incorrect. Uh, make sure that X2 is always, wait, maybe not. If X1 is greater than X2, they swap. Y1 greater than, if the X1 is less than Y1, or X1 is less than Y2, so if it starts before the other ends, and the other one starts before it ends, this, this, is, this is the document, this documentation is correct. <clears throat> X1, X2 is the range, Y1, Y2 is the range. Good night, Alexi. Thanks for thanks for uh, popping in. I mean, the the code right now does what the documentation says, right? <clears throat> this will swap the ranges such that x one is always less than x two. This will swap y one is always less than y two. If x one starts before this one ends. It should have swapped x1, y1. These, these are the two ranges. Ignoring the return, the functionality of this is this. If there's overlap between these two ranges, where x1, x2 is one range, and y1, y2 is another range, both inclusive. The swaps are correct. I'm just making sure that the ordering, uh, that x1 is always less than x2. So if you specify five to three, Show me the usage. Range start, range end, end start, end, 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 end. Range start, range end, end start, end, end. And this is, this is correct. 
it's it's not broken. This is why it's hard because it takes a it it is brutal to think about. But here, here are all here are all possible conditions. Um, can you copy the pastebin? Sure. Um, the return value is not correct, right? The the return value is not correct. The sum versus none, the boolean is. Um, but the uh, the boolean value is correct, but the range that we return is not correct yet. We'll we'll fix that shortly. Um, there you go. Um, and it makes see, here think think about it with me, Desi. If the x1 range starts prior to when the y2 range ends, that means the x1 is before. In all other conditions, if x2 or if x1 is after this range, it, it, there's no overlap. It's impossible. So we make sure that x1 starts before y2. And then we also make sure that y1 starts before x2. And if that is the case, then we know that y1 is before x2 and x1 is before y2. And that, pr that means that this range is overlap. <clears throat> Don't worry, this took me fucking forever to think through. In fact, I think I had to draw this diagram to understand it. <laughs> now, that leaves... I'm going to write a shit ton of tests for this. It's it's definitely correct. <laughs> it's definitely correct. I'm pretty sure I wrote uh, exhaustive tests for this. Um, I think I'm pretty sure that I changed this. So <clears throat> the way you can the way you can test this provably is you can change all of these to U8s, and then you can literally go through the entire four billion possible combinations. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you think a U64 is different than a U8, but I would say they're the same. And I'm pretty sure that's what I did at one point in time. That being said, it's relatively easy to think through at this stage. So Y1 must, bef must come before X2, and X1 must be come before Y2. And that's it. That's the only comparison. So then the overlap range is always going to be... Um, Yeah, I think it's the max. Y1, X2. Yeah. If that or that return none. If X1 is greater than... Yeah. Otherwise, return the max. I'm just going to write down what you said for now. Y1, X2. Oh, the intersection of two intervals. Uh, min, X2, Y2. Oh, it's hard to say... I don't know if they're using the same X1. Oh, they are using the same style syntax as I am. So this is saying that the start of the overlap is either it's the larger of the two. No, in this case, I don't think it's correct. Overlap is always Y1 minus X1 over X2 minus Y2. That's the number of bytes of overlap, right? Here, it's broken. Minus? Um, what do you mean? 3546. No, I, I know this is, I know this internal part is broken. I know this is broken. This, I, yeah, this is broken. We haven't done that yet, right? That's what we're working on now. This, this is not valid. The sum versus none is valid, right? The true versus false, which is all the code does right now. There is no code in this code base that relies on the return uh, pairs because we're, we're changing this function. Previously, it returned a bool if there was overlap, and now we're changing it to return the, um, where the overlap occurs. In this case, y1, x2 is correct in this case. But yeah, I think it's max. Yeah, so let's think through. 
That's correct in this case. But in this case, uh, if there's no overlap, it's fine. And then if there's full containment, this is the only other variant. Well, there's this. Uh, there are only three types of overlap, right? These are the different types of overlap, right? So the overlap starts the larger of the two, y1, x1. And it ends the smaller of the two, x2, y2, in all conditions. That's, that's just what it is. And, and you're right, I see people. You're totally right. Core. Um, so we'll do core compare min, the smaller between x1, y1. And then the max, oh, the, oh, the max of this. And then the min of x2, y2. And here are, here are all the proofs, right? This is every single possible condition. Uh, a, before ma uh, a, a before overlap, an after overlap, and an internal overlap. And in this case, it's correct. The max, we want to take the bigger of the two to start, and we want to take the smaller of these two for the end. And that's what we have now. X1, Y1, X2, Y2. And this is correct in all cases. Um, returns. Uh, OK. And then that means that the size of overlap is those two subtracted plus 1. OK, we did it. Thank you, everyone, for all the help. <laughs> Maybe you should make the arguments be pairs. Yeah, I probably should. <laughs> Quite frankly, they should be ranges. So, <laughs> um, let's do that. Let's be careful, but let's do it. Um, a, what do people use for ranges? A, desu, what's this? Is this the... What's this? This shouldn't be correct, is it? Y1, Y2. Oh, you changed the swap logic. I see. Yeah, you, cha you changed the swap logic. Um... So that y1, y2 is always the inner range. I see. Um, swap those two. If x1 is greater than y1, if x2 is greater than y2, I, I, I like it. Let's, I'm gonna grab it, I'm gonna pull it up if no one's looking. Um, Grab this. So what this does is that, make sure that y1 is always greater than x1. So if x1 is greater than y1, we swap. Wait. Yeah, this doesn't handle in, uh, invalid ranges, which the other one does. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep mine, and also because I'm just very comfortable with it at this stage. <laughs> We're gonna do range. Uh, B range. We're gonna make both these mute. Make sure, uh, make sure uh, range A is always lowest to biggest. In which case, if a.end is greater than a.start, then we swap a.end and a.start. Oops, other way around. If the start, we'll say if the start is after the end, then we'll swap them. Um, and then make sure, same thing here, make sure that the uh, range b is always lowest to highest. In this case, if case, if the B starts after it ends, then we swap it. If it's equal, doesn't matter. 
Does Rust allow invalid language uh, ranges? I'm not sure. In this is not Rust directly, though. So we're not trying to uh, be at parity with Rust. We're implementing our own logic here. In our case, I, wa I want to be able to support invalid ranges, mainly because there's just no cost to really supporting invalid uh, to support invalid ranges. So I might as well. Um, I would rather than than fail closed. Or fail in like a weird way. Okay. So in this case, now I can check x1, which is a dot start, is less than b dot end. And then this is uh, b dot start is less than a dot end. Um, a dot start, b dot start, a dot end, b dot end. When you want to return an option range, you know, you know, <laughs> you know. Um, starts and and then returns the uh, range of the overlap. Uh, determines the determines overlap of A and B. Uh, if there is overlap, returns the range of the overlap. Okay. Uh, and we can change this. Nice. Line that shit up. Good. No, keep the pictures. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I should. Um, and we'll change this to a dot end a dot start b dot start b dot end I do think the picture is actually useful the picture is what made it so I understood what the fuck this was doing um, make it correct uh, return value And we'll just do this, return value. There, bam! Fuck yeah. Determines the overlap of A and B. If there is overlap, returns the range of the overlap. In this overlap returns that. A to start, A to end, B to start, B end. Return value, we use square brackets to mark the uh, inclusivity. And then we just have to change all this code. Um, uh, range start is range dot start. Uh, end is that. And then the other range is start and dot start end is this. Yeah, because ranges are verbose. Yep, that's, uh, I could make a, maybe I made a range new. I don't think I did. I could make a range new, but I'm actually okay with this in this case. In this case, I'm, I'm, I actually don't mind this too much, to be honest. Because it formats well, in my opinion. 128, we're doing this, the same thing here. Now this one is range and end, because these ones are not being modified. So if there is no overlap between the range and the entry, we have nothing to do. That is now done at parity. Yep, that's gonna unwrap a none value. That's an ACPI, because we're doing the unwrap stuff. Anyways, um. I should also return to true if the entirety of A is contained inside of B. Otherwise, returns false. In this case, we're going to have a uh, mute A range, mute B range, bool, most biggest. OK. 
Okay, and then in this case, it's a dot start a dot uh, oops b dot start a dot end b dot end. And this logic is if if it start if it starts after the other one and it ends after the other one, then the uh, oh wait. If A starts, if A starts after B starts, or at the same time, and it ends before B ends, then it's contained entirely. Okay, that's good. Nice. Contains. Nice, this one's easy. Ent range. 238. Um. Oh, this is what I'm writing now. Uh-huh. What is this range library used for? This is for managing uh um this is for managing memory uh, specifically. It's technically used for any ranges, uh, sets of ranges of um non-overlapping ranges. It basically allows uh it allows deduping of overlapping ranges. So overlapping ranges just become the the range um, and then it allows me to like add, subtract, intersect, like do all the different things uh, with these range sets. Um, but I technically use this pretty much only for my memory manager. And it works fantastically for that, to be honest. So now we're going to say uh, get the overlap between this entry and the region that uh, was requested. If, and then here we'll do overlap is equal to overlaps. And we'll say if let sum, if there is overlap, overlaps between the entry and the region, then um, yeah, and this, this makes sure that everything is correctly reported. So when the when the BIOS tells me memory I can use and can't use, some BIOSes fuck up and they'll tell you that you can use memory and also that you can't use memory. So this allows me to construct the range of all memory it tells me I can use, and then it could subtract off all the memory it tells me I can't use, and then that leaves me with a set of things that it was not conflicted of and it was quite positive were free for use. Um, and this allows expressing the entire 64-bit space uh, because all of the ranges are inclusive, so that means a zero to not zero is the entire 64-bit range. We don't use sizes or anything, uh, so we can butt up all the way to the end in case we needed to. Um, but yeah, so now we're changing this to be NUMA aware, such that when someone says, I would like an allocation, preferably in this region, we're implementing that right now. So here we're saying, if there is overlap between the entry, so we're going through all the different ranges, and we're going to say, if there is overlap between the entry and the region, um, oh, actually, specifically, I think we have to add that alignment fix. End is base checked add size minus 1. Um, checked add size minus one, checked add the alignment fix. Um, is that what I want? Oh yeah, because I'll consume everything and then remove that set. So here I'm going to determine if there's overlap. Uh, Okay, there was overlap with the requested region. Then I think what I'll do is I will say um, let overlap is equal to over, uh, well, amount, uh, we'll say overlap amount is equal to um, oh this is hard to do inclusive 
Because making a length is actually... Making a length is pretty difficult to do. So uh, you can't fit a length in a 64-bit int. Um, so what I really care about is if there's overlaps between the region and the alignment base, which is base plus align fix, which we know is in bounds, because we check that end. So we know that region, uh, actually range. So this will be check if there's overlap between this range, which is starting at the base plus the alignment fix, which we know doesn't overflow to the end, which is, um, Uh, the end is just end dot end. Yeah. Yeah. So, what this is going to do is it's going to figure out this, it's going, uh, we get this alignment fix. This will tell me how much I need to add to get the alignment to match up with the requested alignment. Then I will take the base of this region, add the alignment fix, which has been bounds checked to not overflow, and then the entry, or the end of the entry. So at this point, we know that there's this is inside the entry, and this is the end of the entry. And this is saying, can I find an, al an aligned allocation in this region? If I can, um, then allocation is equal to sum base plus um, oh yeah, this consumes the way that this works is this actually consumes base to end to trim up the alignment. So if there's overlap between this range and this region, then we know, well, if there's any overlap, then I need to figure out if the size can satisfy the allocation. So if the size of the overlap, overlap.end minus overlap.start, if that is greater than or equal to the size minus one of the allocation, um, check if the allocation can be satisfied from the overlap, right? Check if the allocation can be satisfied from the overlap. And then in this case, if it can, then Uh, well, that's not necessarily going to be aligned. Yeah, so we're going to just do from the entry. Okay. So then what we're going to do is we're going to align it. Um, let's align overlap is equal to ent... Uh, is equal to overlap dot start the start of the overlap plus um, a line mask and not a line mask and then those we want to do checked ads on all of those I think. Yeah. Uh, well, 
Here we'll just do a wrapping ad. I think... Uh, okay, so this is compute the rounded up alignment from the overlapping region. So we get the start of the overlap between the entry that we're processing and the region. We make sure that this, first we make sure that this entry can satisfy an allocation. If it can satisfy an allocation, then we check to see if there's any overlap. If there is overlap, then we will take a start plus align mask and not align mask. And then we'll say if align overlap is greater than Um, if the alignment overlap is greater than the overlap.start and uh, check for integer overflow. Um, if there is overflow. Uh, okay, we'll do this. Uh, if the alignment overlap is greater than the overlap start, no overflow occurred, and the align overlap is less than or equal to the end dot end uh, oh overlap dot end um, at this point we didn't round past the end uh, so Okay, so if the align overlap is greater than the overlap starts and the align overlap is less than or equal to the end and um, if the alignment overlap is greater than the overlap start and the alignment overlap starts prior to the end of the overlap, which is good just in case the, over, the alignment put us out of bounds. And the overlap.end minus the align overlap um, is greater than or equal to the size minus one. Uh, okay, alignment uh, this is alignments inbounds. Uh, alignments did not cause an overflow. And alignments did not cause uh, exceeding the end. And amount of aligned overlap can satisfy the allocation. <clears throat> so size minus one because we're dealing with the um, we're dealing with the ranges. So we subtract one from the size. I'm just gonna do this for, so it's super explicit. Overlap end minus a line overlap. That cannot underflow. It's impossible because we checked before we did this. That'll give us the size of the range minus one, and then we check if that's greater than or equal to the size minus one, then um, we know that allocation can be satisfied from a start of a line overlap to um, a line overlap plus size minus one. <laughs> so this is the, that's the start, that's the end, and then this is the actual allocation will be here. Okay, uh, we know the allocation can be satisfied uh, starting at a line overlap. And then the allocation size is for size minus one. Size minus one. If size is one, then size is zero. 
in which case it adds one because it's the start and the end. And then we return that as the allocation. When we get to the end, we'll get the base end pointer. We'll remove the base end as an inclusive range. So that needs to be an inclusive range, and it is. And then we return out the pointer, which there it is. OK. So then I have this whole like previous size thing. I think. In this case, uh, and this code's going away, get the requested overlap with the region that was requested, get the alignments. In this case, we get this, we get an allocation, and I think we break out here. But if we do that, if we do that, The problem is I, I'm trying to optimize for two factors. I'm trying to optimize one if we're in this overlapping region. I think what I'm going to do is this will be uh, option range. Um, if, re uh, if region is none, then the uh, allocation will be, and we'll do this. If the region is none, then the allocation will be um, uh, uh, satisfied from anywhere. OK. So then in this case, we'll return a none, or we'll pass in a none. Allocate anywhere from the range set. Allocate prefer, we go into here. And then here we'll say, uh, uh, fuck, if let sum, hmm. Hmm. I don't know if Rust guarantees this ordering, but I want to do this. Uh, if let sum. No, we got to do this. If let sum region is equal to region. Now we got to tab this whole fucking thing in. Uh oh. Uh, you know, it actually fit pretty close. We just made that one change. Uh, uh, if there was a specific region the caller wanted to use check check if there is overlap with this region and then in this case allocation search is here allocation search okay so if no region is specified then the behavior is identical to before where it will try and find the smallest amount of memory to allocate to satisfy the allocation. Otherwise, if a region is specified, then it will find the overlap. It'll align up the overlap to make sure that we can return a pointer that has the alignment requires uh, the alignment that was required. Then we check to make sure that the alignment didn't cause it to overflow, and we make sure that the alignment is in bounds. Then we make sure technically this check is unnecessary because this one will guarantee that um no it, it doesn't necessarily okay good we do need that check then we do the subtraction we make sure there's room at this point we know that at this location we can satisfy an allocation and it's aligned now this is going to probably cause a lot of fragmentation of this range set structure and we got some issues here um 242 int uh, just deref it okay and then size um, expected u64 found u size oh this is a pointer uh, we know that this entire region is in bounds Base and end. Oh, we don't. Um. Uh. that check and then here it's possible that we have a new 
This one says from the start that it's fine, and then this is saying, here we'll do the same check. If a line overlap is greater than core u size max as u64 or um okay let's uh overlap elk end is equal to this or the overlap elk end is greater than core u size max as u64 then continue and we'll say continue allocation search okay uh, make sure the allocation fits in the current addressable address space and then here um Are we allocating 64-bit memory from 32-bit? Yes, we are. Uh, then here we're gonna say uh, compute the inclusive end, inclusive end of this proposed allocation. And then this is uh, overlap elk end. So if the line overlap exceeds a max U size, or if the end exceeds that, then we continue the allocation search. Okay, sweet. All right, so then we had issues. If we set this to like a larger number, I think we had problems, didn't we? What happened if we did this? Um, That's because we implement debug. Let's see. So this gave us issues before when we tried this. And I can't remember why. I think we ran out of stack in the bootloader. Yeah, so we're running out of stack if we do that. And why is that? 256 times 16, that's 4K. We're at 7C00. We should have plenty of room for that. RWX Rob, holy shit, man. What is up? How was your stream? Big ass raids, 103, good to see. Fuck yeah, have fun. See you, RWX, hope, you're, hope you had a great stream. Hope you are having a great day. Hope all your viewers are having a great day. I hope they uh, enjoy this, uh, this fun party we have going on here. <laughs> So we're currently working on a um, NUMA aware allocator for our OS. So we're working on an operating system that we wrote in Rust. Um, and we just, we just wrote an ACPI parser that'll allow us to parse the ACPI tables that will tell us for each core on the system, which physical memory range is most local to that core, which one's most, uh, most performant. So what we're doing is we're changing our physical memory allocator in our kernel to understand what to do with this information. So if someone, if uh, APIC number 104 came by and said, I would like some physical memory, I want to make sure that the physical memory allocator will bias trying to give that core allocations from this range, this, this specific uh, uh, physical address range. So we just changed we just actually implemented that logic in our physical memory allocator, which our physical memory allocator is done with a uh, set of ranges. So we have inclusive 64-bit sets of ranges uh, that are non-overlapping in this range set. It's a set non of non-overlapping inclusive U64 ranges. And we just implemented allocate prefer, where we can provide a region that if we give it a region, it will try to find an allocation that can fit with the alignment requirements and the size requirements in that region. If it can, it will prefer using that allocation, so it will return that out. So, and if, it, if we don't specify a preferred range, it'll just do whatever. And if it can't satisfy the allocation out of the preferred range, it'll fall back to just returning from anywhere. So that's what we currently did. 
How are you doing? Archification. I heard you're building a kernel in Rust. Have you heard of Redox OS? Uh, or maybe you're the one who built it. I don't know. So um, this is not, <laughs> yeah, this is not Redox. Uh, I am familiar with Redox. I've never really worked on the internals. Uh, but this is kind of a twist on what the things that I like in an operating system. So we're doing this quite different from a conventional operating system. We're not going to have threads. We're not going to have tasks. We're not going to have a user land. We're not going to have all these fancy features that people want. But we're going to have massive amounts of performance. We're going to have a hypervisor. We're going to have no deadlocks. We're going to have protections on all of our locks and all of our globals so there will be no race conditions and no corruption. So we're basically uh, imparting the Rust philosophy into an operating system. Everything's in ring zero, correct. So except for the hypervisor guest, that will spin up a ring three thing. <laughs> Who doesn't want an OS that is performant? Uh, yep. Primarily, this is mainly for uh, CPU research. So I have previously found CPU bugs on Intel processors. If you're familiar with Spectre, Spectre and Meltdown, I have found similar bugs in Intel processors. And I do a lot of research uh, about trying to introspect and learn as much about the processor as possible. So in an environment like this that I control uh, entirely, it's pretty easy for me to make sure uh, that the system is silent or like super quiet. And what I mean by that is that I can disable interrupts and there will be no interrupts, no timers, no devices, no hardware, no DMA, nothing happening on the system. It's completely silent except for what I'm doing. And that is really important for me to be able to measure uh, very minute microarchitectural events like uh, seeing new cache lines get evicted, which are pretty loud. Like a cache line getting evicted is in the order of dozens of cycles, which to me is a massive amount of time. I'm looking for things that happen within a single cycle itself. Uh, so having a really quiet environment is really important. And that's one of the goals of this OS. The other goal of this OS is to develop on stream and have fun and, and you know teach people OS dev, have people ask questions, see if people are interested in this stuff. And it seems like that is the case. Um, and also, I do security research where I try and look for ODA. I, look, I try to look for uh, critical bugs, security bugs in software. So we're also implementing a hypervisor that'll allow us to run Linux, Windows, whatever guest we have, and uh, gather coverage, determine like what that program is actually doing, uh, capture crashes of that, and then quickly be able to reset it. And when I say quickly be able to reset an OS, I don't uh, reset a, a VM. I don't mean like it takes a second to reset a VM. I mean like I want to be able to reset a VM 150 plus thousand times per second. So that's, uh, that's the kind of stuff that we're looking at doing uh, for sure. Temple OS was technically impressive in it. And technically impressive in a few niche ways. Custom compiler and straight assembly, live kernel patching, uh, 3D graphics in a terminal. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, Temple OS definitely has some cool features. Definitely has some weird features, <laughs> but it has some pretty cool features. And quite frankly, I, I respect Terry Davis for, for his work, uh, however uh, interesting um, of a person he may be. Um, well, it is God's OS. Yeah, yeah, it is. Do you know about uh, Genoda OS? I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation. And Fuchsia. I do not know about Genoda OS. Uh, I've never heard of that. Fuchsia I am familiar with. So um, I know one of the Fuchsia lead developers uh, because he's part of the OS dev community. And I've been talking with him on IRC for longer than Fuchsia has existed. So I've gotten to hear about all kinds of crazy internals and things they're working on there. King Julian, hell yeah, thanks for the follow. Absolutely. We're about to, we're about to get that partner, I think, uh, in the next one or two streams. He passed away. I feel like I heard that. Yeah, I feel like I heard that like a year or two ago. That's so sad to hear. I think he was in a downward spiral, which is really unfortunate. Yeah, he was a... T yeah. Suicide by train, yeah. So, it was a disturbed person. It's, it's unfortunate. 
very, very, very skilled, but some sometimes you win one lottery and you lose another. You have to apply for it at uh, partner sign up. Yep, I'm just waiting for that achievement to hit. Technically, they, they probably have wiggle room on that, but we're actually really close. So the Twitch achievements or whatever, um, you have to stream like 12 times in the past 30 days, and I'm at like 11 out of 12. <laughs> and the number of hours, I'm blown past number of hours because these streams are always fucking 16 hours long. <laughs> okay. So we got this running. Uh, we're trying to figure out why our bootloader doesn't run, and that's because we changed uh, the size of these ranges to be way too large. Um, but I'm trying to figure out why that's a problem. So we're still fitting here in the bootloader limitation. So we're limited for the bootloader that we wrote in Rust. We're limited to uh, 32 kilobytes, um, and we are at 83% utilization with this massive number. Uh, we could... Also, we could also bootstrap the range set and then promote it to like a new one potentially. Um, so we could do that way past the 75 viewers too. Yeah, you know, these past streams, it seems like I'm always getting 150 plus, which is fucking crazy, man. Thanks for everyone for an, uh, hanging out. I'm just here to have fun and, and kind of do what I would be doing otherwise, but on stream. So right now, we're seeing this print a message over and over to the screen, like once every second. And that's because the VM's actually crashing. We call that triple faulting. And a triple fault is effectively a reboot. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the grand top number one no scope version of an exception that you can possibly get. It is when your exception handler had an exception while handling the exception of itself. Uh, <laughs> it's not a good place to be. So I think right now we're running out of stack in the uh, bootloader. So let's check that out. Um, and the reason for that is we're initializing a large structure here. In this case, the structure is 256 ranges, which is uh, 256 ranges times 16. That's 4K plus a 32. So this is, uh, uh, that's going to be plus 8. So 4104 bytes. And... Uh, let's see where we are on the memory map. So we allocate a stack at 7C00. But it looks like I should have about 30K here. So I actually don't know what is causing that then. Um, let's take a look at uh, bootloader source. I think it's possible that this is causing a check stack. And check stack, we might have panicking. Uh, shared core requirements. So we, I do want to figure this out because I would like a larger range. Oh, uh, frame handler? Are we hitting that? I'm going to just put that as a ret and we're going to see if we're hitting that. I don't, I don't think that's what we're hitting. The frame handler should be something else, if I'm not mistaken. Oh. It's not crashing. Weird. So that seems like that might be in play. Let's see if we're triple faulting again. And we are. So this, something's in play here. What is, what does this do? It's used to handle structured exception frames. Um, so the stack is at, we put the stack at 7C00 and it grows down. And basically what this is showing me is that when we have that too large, this range, if the range set is too large, let's see where we use range set. So this is what we changed. We changed the range set, and the range set is, we use it by reference here. We allocate it here on the stack. Here, we put it in a global. So let's take a look at uh, bootloader source MM, the memory manager for the bootloader. And that's going to create 
a rain set called Free Memory. I don't know why I'm not just creating that in place. I'm going to do that. Right now I'm creating it on the stack. RG range set new. It's only this is the only spot where we create a range set. Um so I'm going to just put the range set directly in pmem, but I have to be able to initialize it on the stack. So let's Unfortunately, in the bootloader, we can't actually see why things are crashing. Uh, it's very quiet when crashes occur. So I'm going to put some prints in here. Print um, making range set. Here I'll put, uh, I can't print like that. I have to do boot args dot serial. Get access to the serial driver as we're going to lock the serial driver for use. Get access to it mutably. Unwrap. It looks gross. I know it does, but... In the bootloader, uh, using print causes format code to get pulled in, which causes too much code bloat. So this is the um, range set done, and we're going to see if we're crashing there. And I, I would suspect we are. Oops, this is uh, unwrap.write. And I think this takes bytes, so we'll send those the bytes. Okay, here we go. Okay, now we're getting panic and bootloader making rain set. So we're panicking somewhere in this stage. I think the stack's getting screwed up at this stage. How many times did you use unsafe so far? A, a, a pretty large amount, to be honest, but pretty minimally. Like, we used it in many places, but quite lightly. Um, and we've been very careful... Uh, in terms of structuring things to minimize the amount of unsafe that we have to implement. Um, the kernel that we wrote is pretty bulletproof. It's pretty difficult to cause deadlocks. It's pretty difficult to cause... Um, in fact, you can't cause a deadlock that you didn't cause yourself by literally locking something twice, like in the same scope. Uh, and we have really good deadlock detection that prints like where you got a deadlock. Um, we have some a lot of fail-closed things that we implemented. Uh, which makes this kernel pretty resilient to any corruption, even if we fucked up some unsafe in a couple spots. Um, in terms of assembly, we have like 20 lines of assembly in the bootloader, and then we have like 100 lines of assembly. Yeah, we have a, about 20 lines of assembly to boot, maybe 50 lines now, and then about 100 lines of assembly in the bootloader that allow us to access real mode APIs. Uh, which we need to get information from the BIOS. Unfortunately, we're forced to. Um, I'm being very careful. Uh -huh. I'm going to stack overflow and seven lines of rust without unsafe. There are no errors or warnings from the compiler. Oh, like a stack, uh, stack exhaustion, like infinite recursion or something. That's pretty easy to do, unfortunately. Um, and I think rust says that is fine. So in this case... We're in problems creating this structure. And the reason for that is, let's take a look at how big the stack frame is. So we're gonna go and take a look at the bootloader. Uh, bootloader i release bootloader dot exe vim dash. And uh, we're looking at a range set new. Ooh, range set. Okay, so here's insert. This is the function. Oh, God. S um, so it calls check stack. We get past that. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. I think check stack must sub the stack. Because the stack is not, check stack must allocate the stack for it. We're going to take a quick little squiz. Um, let's see if check stack, see if it's documented. Called by the compiler, like check stack is definitely subbing that stack. Um, I'm going to see if I can get this code up here quickly. Uh, mount storage. Um, 
Okay. Tag check stack. RG check stack. Um, this is for 32-bit mode. Do, do, do. Where's 32-bit code here? Um... So I can find the 64-bit code. That. So the 64-bit code, I'm just checking. Um, huh. Supplies the allocation. Deallocate stack frame, okay. I don't have the 32-bit one, but based on this code generation, it appears as if check stack is supposed to set up the stack because, uh, because no one's subtracting from the stack. And that would make sense. We're literally corrupting the bootloader itself. And that would make sense why we're getting these weird results. So I think check stack, we're gonna have to I'm guessing it needs this many bytes. So we'll probably wanna sub that from the stack in check stack. But I, I really would like to find proof of what this does. Um, someone has to have uh, talked about this. Um, there was one of there's 186 lines of unsafe rust. That's not bad. How did you get that count out of 2745? That's pretty fucking good. That's a lot less than I expected. Cargo count? Uh, cargo install count? Is it like just count? Cargo count. Hell yeah. Because I have a later version here. I haven't pushed in about a day because we've had things kind of broken. We need to polish this stuff up a little bit. Um, cargo count. Oh, cargo count. Oh, and that's in the kernel. Uh, is there an unsafe? Um, and is that going to just look at this project? No, yeah, that won't be looking, uh, yeah, 167 lines. What did you say? 186? We got rid of code! We got rid of unsafe code! Woo! Whoop, whoop, whoop! <laughs> wow. Under 10% unsafe. That's honestly pretty good, given we haven't really written any code yet. Like, all the code we've been doing has been actual low-level kernel interrupt sort of code. Um... The second we start writing an actual like program or something that does something other than kernel things, that percentage will drop to like one or two percent pretty quickly. So I'm trying to find this check stack code. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the I don't have the 32-bit version. Let me uh, I'm gonna look in a different spot quick. But I do need this pretty bad. Um, okay, so we're going to take a look.
here. Okay. Um. What is this? Okay. I'm I'm trying to find the code for check stack to see if it if it does that. Cause if if it's it, it definitely is subbing the stack, but I need to make sure that I understand exactly how it's subtracting from the stack. Um, how's everyone's days going so far? Blah blah blah. Okay. Mm. Okay. Um. So it does allocate on the stack. Uh, hmm. Okay. So yeah, I think I just have to sub that. I'm pretty sure. Uh, we'll try it. So check stack. Gonna move that out of core rex. Frame handler, that's fine. That's hit on a panic, I think. Um, then, bootloader source, intrinsics, check stack, global, Assembly, so I'll write some global assembly here, and this will implement the 32 bits check stack. Cargo run, probably gonna fail to build on the bootloader. Oh, and we need the bootloader to bootloader source main. We don't have main open in the bootloader. Global assembly. Okay. So this is just, uh, okay, so the kernel, we don't have this. So we'll have check stack here and we will pop EAX. Um, which is allowed. I'm allowed to clobber EAX from this. Yeah, so I can clobber EAX. So this is uh, get the return location. And I think I'll use these comments here, I think is what this takes. So we're gonna get the return location. That's the return address, um, return address. And then we'll do a jump EAX to jump back to the return site. And then we'll sub ESP EAX. Um, Oh yeah, what what can I clobber in here? I I can okay. We're gonna push ECX uh, save off ECX. So we know that EAX um, EAX is the size of the stack allocation, right? It was EAX. Yeah, EAX is the size of the stack allocation uh, needed. We're going to save off ECX. We're then going to um, save off ECX, compute the stack address we should return, in which case um, we're going to add. Do I need to save off ECX? I can add EAX4, 
Um, make room for the stack address. Er, so when we called into this, I actually want to subtract that. Wait, no. EAX is the size that I want. I want to subtract from that. Uh, subtract uh, size. This is we're gonna compute the stack address, the amount of offset to apply to the current stack. Yeah, compute the offset needed to the current stack. Um, we subtract off four to uh, we subtract off four to. Um, remove the return address. So the, uh, here, we subtract off four from the requested stack frame size because the return address is already present from that allocation. And then this, we will um, allocate the room on the stack as requested. So we'll do a subtract from ESP of EAX. So if it requested four bytes, it called this function. That pushed four bytes of return. So we subtract off four. Then we subtract off zero, which will then leave the stack at the location that it should be. And then we're going to get the, uh, then the return address is at ESP plus EAX. Um, this is jump D word pointer. Um, this is uh, jump to the return location. I think this. I think this is correct. <laughs> uh, subtract four from EAX. Make room on the stack, and then jump. Pointer uh, deref the stack plus EAX, which is the old stack value upon entry. That is correct. Fuck. Um, oh, uh, Intel. And I think ATT. Uh, how do I do that? Uh, kernel source interrupts. ATT syntax. Intel syntax. So we use real syntax here. Use that Intel syntax. There we go. Okay. So this, I think, will work. Well, hot damn. Sweet. Well, that was easy. Subtract four, EAX. So this said, I want this many bytes. We then call. We then subtract off four from that. We'll end up subtracting that from the stack. We give that to it. EAX is a clobber. That's fine. We're done. That's perfect. We have no bugs. Um, <laughs> I think we got that, actually. I think we did. We can get rid of these prints. OK. So now this is booting into the kernel. And sweet. And then let's try this on real hardware. Uh, oh. We changed our bootloader, so we're going to need to reboot all of our physical machines. So I'm going to go do that. So I'm going to reset uh, the phi, and then um, yeah. So this might really hurt our range set speed. No, it actually shouldn't, because we only copy those range sets based on the in use. Let me see, uh, when I remove, when I insert into this range set range, I'm pretty sure, and we'll reset this other box too. Um, if I add a range, what do I have in use? Anywhere that I use this, delete. That swaps to the end, okay, yeah. That is good. I'm, yeah, I'm going up to in use, uh, which is good. 
Which is exactly what I want. I don't want to end up, um... I don't want to end up, uh... Copying more than I need, I, so I don't end up move the, moving the whole thing. Because we're going to start to have a lot more fragmentation in this, which is fine. Uh, I don't care about the speed of this allocator. This is for getting physical memory for the first time, and then that physical memory will be dumped into the actual... Um, that'll be dumped into the uh, uh, free list, so we don't have to worry about that. Okay. All right, uh, losing my train of thought here. Okay, so that's working. Cool, let's see if this hardware's up yet. Yes, it is, so the Phi is up. Perfect, so the Phi is working. We have all the ranges. Um, and then Lenovo's coming up here. That's up, we're all good, okay. Sweet, so we have all these ranges and we need to let the memory manager know um, about those ranges, and then we're, we're losing bytes due to print locks being held here, aren't we? No, we shouldn't be. I think this is actually just due to, uh, bugs on the IPMI stuff. Um. I don't think this is due to locks. Um. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think it is. Yeah, like, this would, it would make no sense to lose these bytes. Because we have a lock on the serial port when we're writing APIC. So, it's not, yeah. It, it's, it's IPMI, man. The, the serial ports are really fucked. So. Yeah, we're doing this before locks. Yep, I agree. And also, we, yeah, never mind. Okay, so now what we have to do is we have to inform the memory manager of these ranges. So the memory manager has to know about these ranges and the APIC lookups. Um, I don't think I want to do a lookup in the B tree. I think I can actually make a vector of all of these. Uh, these are mainly sequentially allocated, the APIC identifiers. So I don't think I should really use a B tree. I can do an O1 lookup. So what I need is... Given an APIC ID, or more specifically, given an APIC ID, I need to get, um, this is an ACPI. Given an APIC ID, I want to let the memory manager know. I might just give the memory manager these structures, and then the memory manager can figure out what to do. VEC option mapping, yeah, like that would totally work. And then if... The question is, do I want the mapping for each node, or do I want a two level? And I think I just want a flat one, to be honest. It'll, it'll actually be faster. Instead of having the, instead of the core figuring out its NUMA node, and then that going to the mapping, I think it's best to just have dupes of the mappings. Um, you'll ever only use the mapping of your core, so you're only using the cache line for the one lookup. It actually will be faster and save cache lines to do one level. So we will do that. That's something I've never done in my, actually. <laughs> uh, this is static, um, APIC. Uh, APIC to, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to put a lock on this fucking thing. No, no I'm not. We're gonna have a fixed size. We can do big ass globes, big ass globals. So we'll do APIC to um, memory range, and we'll do a, uh, a U64, U64, a fizz adder for U64, and we'll do U size here, just so it's clear. Uh, and then we'll just say like 1024. Uh, this will be an option. This will be equal to non-1024. Now, I can put locks on each of them. Uh, so I should be able to create that. Yep. Um... Shit.
I mean, this doesn't do anything yet. Uh, the problem is I can't, I can't modify any of these entries unless I make it a, a mutable static, and I don't want to do that. I mean, I might have to. Well, the performance of this doesn't matter too much because we're gonna use our free lists. Just new atomic pointer initialized to vec. Like have the pointer initialized to, uh, to a vector, uh, a pointer to yeah, or a box or whatever. So like put th put this in a box, put an atomic pointer here. I could make this just static mute. To be honest, it has the same effect. Box box ref range yeah. Yeah, I think we will do that. I think this will be an atomic pointer to a um, to a range. And atomic pointer. Bam. Okay. And then this will have atomic pointer new core pointer null mute. Okay. No, not not this. Not what you're saying, Desu. <clears throat> um table which is indexed by an APIC identifier to map to a uh, physical Range which is local to it on the numa on its numa node. I'm initializing this once and edit to a heap allocated array. Oh, the whole fucking thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I don't I don't know what I was thinking. You're totally right. This isn't a yeah an atomic pointer to a vec. Can I do a pointer to a vector? I don't think I can. Right? A fat pointer to an array. Oh yeah, because that's static. No, I no, I can't do a fat pointer. You can't you can't do a fat pointer for a for an atomic pointer. How would you co how would you compare exchange? How do you atomically do a size and a length? Yeah, there's no way. No way. Um, so I could do a bo I could do a boxed vector. <laughs> Are we body shaming pointers? I think we'll just do this. Right? Um, right. It'll panic if we go out of that range anyways. It'll, it'll fail, it'll fail pretty cleanly. Okay. So now we'll do unsafe. Uh, pub unsafe fn register numa nodes and this will take a this will take these, these b tree maps um so we'll use use core oh use alec oops use alec collections b tree map and this will take a So we'll take domains. Oh, and this will be uh Oh yeah, it will just take range. It'll totally just take range. Um I'll find the overlap, that'll do the same thing. Uh it'll eventually find a 4K thing, start splitting it up. 
I don't think fragmentation is going to be a huge issue. I don't know if I want to do option range or range. I can fill the range with a full range, but that does kind of hurt the fragmentation of my physical memory manager. Because if I say none, oh, the function literally takes an option anyways. Might as well do this. The function already takes an option, so I have to construct an option anyways. So I might as well do an option range. Um, because none is a special case where it will use the smallest amount of memory. Uh, whereas when you pick a specific range, it will abort the second it finds a match. Uh, because it doesn't want to keep going on and weigh two of them. So we'll do this. Register NUMA nodes. This is going to be... Uh, Oops, rolled over my headphone cable. Okay, uh, we're gonna have the, ooh. What are the shapes of these structures? It's just these return values, it's these. Um, and we're gonna have uh, apic to uh, domain, and then this is domain to mem, and then we'll make the range here. Yeah, we'll do this. Okay. Uh, and this will um, establish the apic to memory range uh, global with the uh, apic IDs to their corresponding NUMA local memory regions. Okay. Uh, for, for apic domain in apic to domain dot iter for, and then we're going to do this. Oh, we'll make the allocation. Let, uh, let, Mute, uh, what do I want to say? Apic mappings is equal to vec new uh, with capacity 1024. Uh, actually, we gotta we gotta do uh, we gotta we gotta make a box. Box syntax is that stable yet? Well, it doesn't matter. We'll just do box new. Because I don't think that box syntax is stable yet. Um, use alloc boxed box. Uh, create a heap based uh, database. And then in this case, Close print at the arg list. Yes, thank you very much. I was wondering why all of that was a little bit off. Okay, for each apic and domain, and I think we ref both separately. None, cannot infer type parameter. Yeah, that's fine. And then we'll do um, apic to memory range store apic mappings into raw um, ordering sequentially consistent, uh, store the APIC mapping database into the global. Um, oh yeah, yeah, this is box into raw because it has to move that, which it does, okay. So now uh, go through each APIC to uh, domain mapping, and then we'll do, we know those are exclusives, so we can do APIC mappings, APIC, and then if that's out of bounds, that'll panic, and they'll panic in a clean way, I'm fine with that. Um, and then, Apic mappings apic is equal to um, domain to mem dot get 
based on the domain, and we'll just do this, get the domain dot map. So this is now giving us, we have a fizz adder u64, so we have a patter size. And then we will convert this into a range. Uh, and we have range. Start is physical address dot zero, end is patter dot zero, checked, add size minus one. Uh, oh yeah, we'll just do this. Ooh, how do I do this if the size is zero? Uh, yeah, flat map. Because flat map will let me return a uh, none here. And then I can do this. If size is uh, greater than zero, then we can do this. Check dad, size minus one. Um, and we'll do this syntax. Clean that up a little bit. That else none. Uh, okay. So this will be uh, convert the fizz adder. Try adder. Try. Can you do try on this? Oh, no flat map on. Oh, it's not flat map. It's and then. And then as Rust flat map. Um, okay, and then size, we can ref. Oh, this whole thing is the ref. Yep, yeah, yep, yep, yep. Uh, as you size. And then expected a, an option, found a range, set range. Ah, that's a sum. And then can we really use the question question mark there? We can. Huh. Checked sub one question. Cool. All right. So subtract one. If that fails, then we got a problem. Check to add that, and then it's none. Okay. And now we have these ranges. Hell yeah, we're really close. Um, ACPI. And then here, when we get to the end, unsafe, uh, we're already in an unsafe, mm, uh, notify the memory manager of the known uh, APIC to NUMA mappings. Okay, register NUMA nodes. Um, this is if let sum AD sum MD is equal to APIC domains memory domains. And we can consume these, we can move these. In fact, we're moving, we're doing by move here, and I'm fine with that. Uh, epic domains, memory domains, move that shit over. And then that has updated the mm, and this will be create mm. Oh, and these are, this is ADMD. Uh, oh, <laughs> now we have a. Now we got a check stack on uh, this side of things. I think check stack in 64 bit doesn't actually update the stack. Let me see, MD64. Um, uh, okay, and then that will allocate the stack. Let's take a look. Um, 
I think the 32-bit one's different. And we'll prove that by check stack. Oh, we don't have check stack yet, so let's add it into kernel source. Hmm. Intrinsics RS global asm. This. Uh, and then global check stack, check stack. I think I can just ret in this case, but we'll see what code gets produced. Oh, we got to link that up uh, in main. Let's say mod intrinsics. Okay. So now that's built. We can now check the uh, code gen, check stack, of course. Yeah, here, move EAX this, call sub RSP racks. So I think it's safe to say I can just ret out of that one. Already have your da uh, daily call? No, it's in uh, it's in an hour and a half. I'll probably I might I might still miss it. Who knows? Uh, I'll actually get a notification when that pops up, so that'll be good. Okay, so we're gonna do uh, notify the memory manager of that. Sweet. And that check stack, we know that we can use that. Here we're gonna do this. Okay, that will program the memory manager to do that. And now, uh, we're gonna put the APIC ID in core. Uh, where do we get the APIC ID from? Um, local APIC ID. We'll zoom out just a smidge, smidge. Sorry if you guys can't read this. I can, ha <laughs> ha. Uh, P6 family and Pentium, Pentium 4 and Xeon and later, and then the X2 APIC there. The APIC ID, the APIC ID and the CPU ID is the initial APIC ID. And we don't care about that. We care about the actual APIC ID. So we'll get the APIC ID. Um, and I'll read 20. That will return 31 bits. OK. So in APIC, we'll have a, when we're setting up the core, we don't actually have the APIC programmed yet. And we use core when we set up the APIC, don't we? Oh, shit. Yeah, we're grabbing the APIC lock here. Um, shit. Because this programs the APIC in place on the core. I think we might initialize the APIC on the core itself. Let's see where I use core in this file. Boot args. That's so I can map it. We use core and timer interrupt. That's fine. Enable timer. That's fine. Disable timer. That's fine. Init. OK. So we're, we're, we're going to actually make init return an APIC. And then this will take. This will return the new APIC. This will allow us to get an APIC working. And then core. It's, it's unsafe to do this, I think. Yeah, we're going to make this unsafe FN to init the APIC. And we'll do this very early on. And then I need access to boot args. Oh, physical memory. That uses core to make these mappings. Shit. Um.
I, hmm. Ooh, that's kind of rough. I can put, so right now I, I want to cache the APIC ID in the, um, in the, I want to cache the APIC ID in the core structure, but I can't get the APIC ID. I can't get the APIC ID until I initialize the APIC, and initializing the APIC assumes that I have access to core. Um, so what I might do, I might be able to just have this, um, I might be able to have this program, the APIC, so the, uh, I could have it just program the APIC, but I, I need that mapping. I could get, well, this mapping I need because it's uh, cache disable. Shit. Oh, that's brutal. I can have the core ID. I can, I can, I can have the APIC ID be initialized late and then have it on a atomic U32. I think that's what we're gonna do. I don't wanna change this. This would get dramatically more complex to a point that I would say is not worth it. Um, so what we're going to do is we're gonna have, we're gonna cache the APIC ID. So core, uh, okay, we can close some of this stuff. Check stack, done, panic, done for now-ish. APIC done for now ish. Um, kernel mm, we're gonna do that. Range set, we're done with that. Core rex, we're done with that. Bootloader main, we're done with that. ACPI, not quite done with that yet. Okay, so kernel source main, uh, we're gonna open up kernel source core locals. Then we're gonna add another field to the core local structure. Uh, and this is gonna be the APIC ID. This will be atomic U32. And this will be get the um, current APIC ID. Uh, get the core's APIC ID. Okay. And we wanna make some of these things non-pub. I need to, I'm gonna make note of that. Um, do, do, do. Uh, non pub core locals. Okay, so I have that. We'll do that when we do code cleanup. Um, these we, yeah, some of this code we hacked in here pretty quickly. Um, so we added that field. Now we have the APIC ID for the core and it's going to be atomic U32 new bang zero, which is invalid because that's a broadcast APIC ID, and then we'll do atomic U32. Okay, and then we will have um, pub unsafe FN set APIC ID self, uh, APIC ID U32, and this will be um, sets the uh, current cores apic id and this will do self dot apic id dot store apic id ordering sequentially consistent and then we'll do a uh, pub fn apic id self u32 self dot apic id dot load apic id uh oops ordering sequentially consistent. The ret is this, assert ret is not equal to zero. Uh, APIC ID has not been set yet. And ret uh, gets the current cores APIC ID um, cannot be used until the APIC has been initialized. 
I mean, we could honestly put that in a lock. Nah, I think it's nice having it this way. Okay. So that'll set it. That's unsafe. Getting it is safe. It'll panic if it hasn't been set yet. Um, and then if you set it to something broken, then that was your fault because that's unsafe. And getting it will always make sure that it's been initialized. Okay, so that means I should be able to print the APIC ID here. Print APIC ID this uh, core APIC ID. And this should panic. Nice, APIC ID has not been set yet. Awesome. And the APIC ID will be set in initialize the APIC. So in APIC, we will set, um, this is uh, wrap up the mode in the APIC structure, uh, sets the cores APIC reference, and then uh, software enable the APIC, and then this is uh, program the cores APIC ID, and we'll do uh, core set apic id in unsafe code and we'll get this from uh new apic get uh apic id and apic id will be able to use on an apic but it'll be slow it'll be an expensive operation so here we'll do pub fn apic id self uh, get the APIC ID of the current, uh, get the APIC ID of the current, um, APIC, of the APIC, yeah, of the current running core, then this will do a, uh, let APIC ID is equal to, um, I have a write apic. I don't have a read apic. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, we'll grab the write apic. Grab this. It's going to be read apic. Get a value. On safe. Return a U32. Basic checks. Read volatile from that location. Or read MSR from this MSR. Um, and then we'll upcast that to U64. Yeah, we'll keep it as a U32, as U32. Uh, read the value using the X2 APIX. Read the value using the APIC uh, memory. Change this to memory map. Okay. So we're going to read the APIC here with an offset. This is going to... Uh, read a value from the APIC at a given memory offset, at a given memory offset. This is up to the color to make sure the offset correctly indexes a valid 32-bit APIC register. Get the 32-bit APIC register, there we can read volatile. That doesn't need to be mute. In fact, it wouldn't build. Okay. And then this, yeah, that should fail. I want that to fail, and we're just going to do uh, APIC ID U32. We're going to return 0. I'm actually really surprised. Oh, read APIC. Make that non-mute. Now that fails. Okay, nice. Okay, beautiful. Then read APIC. Let APIC ID. We're going to read the APIC ID register, which is at 20 hex. Self.read apic ox20 uh read the apic id register and then i need to shift that into place um depending on the mode so match self.mode ref apic mode apic then, and I think those bits are reserved as zero. 
So we're going to shift it by 24 in this case. APIC ID shift by 24. APIC mode x2 APIC. Return this. And we'll get the APIC ID. And that's it. Um, uh, adjust the APIC ID based on the current APIC mode. If we're in APIC mode, we'll shift it to the right by 24. Otherwise, we will keep it as is for the X2 APIC because we just read 802. Okay. Uh, oh, whoops. APIC mode. Oh, I'm doing something silly here. X2 APIC. Oh, there's no fields. All right, uh, 32, unsafe function. Yep. Bam. So this will now program the APIC ID. APIC ID zero, woo. Okay, so now we can bring up other cores. So now we can do a pub unsafe FN IPI mute self. And this is a send and enter processor interrupt to a specific APIC ID. And this will take the APIC ID, uh, this will be the destination APIC ID, and then this will take a, this is gonna write the ICR, this is the ICR val U64, and that's going to write ICR with the value how does that work? I think I have to set the top bits. So in this case, it'll write the high part, then the low part. Okay. So here, we want to write ICR um, let ICR val is equal to oh, this is the um, this is the IPI. And then we're going to convert let apic id is equal to based on the mode that we're in we'll take the dest apic id and we'll shift it to the left by 24 otherwise dest apic id so this will be um convert the destination apic id into the correct location based on the apic mode and here we're going to write an ICR of the dest APIC ID as U64 shift 32 or IPI as U64. Uh, construct the IPI command and send it. Uh, and then we just got to put some, we got to put some parens around this. Okay. So here we're going to send an IPI to destination ID, and then we're going to do a self write, self write ICR. Okay. So now, that's going to send a raw, send a raw IPI. Uh, it is up to the caller to make uh, sure the dest APIC ID is valid and the the IPI is a valid IPI type format. Okay, so that just sends a raw ICR. <laughs> Why not use VS Code? I'm just not a huge fan. I think VS Code is a little too bloated, a little bit too slow. Um, it's a little bit cumbersome to use, in my opinion. <laughs> no offense, but is he a little autistic in the genius way to be able to do this? Just trying to understand if a regular brain can achieve this level? Absolutely. Um, this is just a lot of work. I've just been doing this for a, uh, a long time, and I've put a lot of effort, and I mean, I've spent a lot of days working hours on doing stuff like this. Um, so... I don't think everyone can do this. It is it is difficult, but I think a lot of people can. Like a 
a large amount of people can do this. Uh, a lot of systems developers could potentially understand this stuff. I think the, the biggest differentiator is that I'm doing this for fun. Uh, and since I'm doing this for fun, I can put a little bit more effort um, into my learning and into the designs that I want to do. Uh, if I were doing this for a job, I would be kind of forced to maybe cut corners, do things quicker. That would cause me to maybe not learn as much. Maybe I would have to uh, just listen to an expert and just assume that he's right or something like that, or he or she is right, um, or they. Um, so it's, I don't know. I think being able to have the freedom to just do this at my own pace, which is uh, often relatively slow pace in terms of learning and exploring and branching out, um, but fast pace in terms of the speed of development. So I write code very quickly, but I get things done very slow because I, I go very broad and I try and understand all the ramifications. Thank God some people still use Vim Emacs rather than new GUI editors. How do you type so fast? Um, I, I don't know. I, I guess I don't consider myself that fast of a typer. Like, I think I'm in, the, like, that top, top like, 2 to 3%. And for programming, I'm probably in, like, that top 1% in terms of being able to type, like, characters and stuff. But I have seen people who aren't even computer people who can type much faster than me. So I don't like to say that I'm a fast typer. It's crazy. It's really weird when I'm, like, watching someone who's not even, like, a developer. Maybe they're just a gamer or something like that. And they don't use their computer that much. But they type so fucking fast. It's weird. Is there a face reveal? Um, I don't have a webcam up just because it covers the screen, uh, but uh, I have shown the webcam before. I'm not I'm not private about my face or my identity. Um, let's edit text using a web browser, VS Code. Yeah, it was pretty nice at the start. How fast do you type? I probably sustain. Probably, I probably can sustain about 90 to 95 words a minute, and then I can probably peak to 120 to 130 for uh, common words or when I'm not making mistakes. I have a pretty high error rate uh, when I'm typing, so I actually get quite a bit of typing loss just through mistakes. And that's actually, that's maybe why my typing looks so fast, because I probably type at like a 130, 140 word per minute, but I make mistakes that brings it down to like 90 words per minute. But when you see me typing, it looks really fast because you see the uh, deletions and stuff as well. What book is that? Uh, if you're talking about this book right here, this is the Intel manual. This is the Intel systems manual that we're using for reference. Um, okay, so we're gonna send an IPI. Oh shit, we're bringing up cores. We're bringing up course. I just realized that that's what we're doing. We're about to bring up the course. So uh, ACPI and NIT. Here we're gonna let uh, system apex is equal to this. Here we're going to uh, get all of the apex on the system. And then ACPI is gonna return the, this is going to return apex. Um, and it's possible that's none. And this is just uh, a vector of U32 uh, option, vector U32. And this is uh, returns a vector of all usable APIC IDs on the system. Okay. Um, if there are no usable APICs, then we return none. Perfect. So now we're going to say. Uh, if let some, we'll say valid apex, get all the apex on the system and initialize uh, NUMA allocations. Oh, we haven't made NUMA take effect yet, uh, but that's because I want to do this. So if uh, actually for apex invalid apex, if apex is equal to the core. Uh, if the core APIC ID is equal to the APIC, uh, continue. Um, we don't want to uh, boot, we don't want to start ourselves. 
And then we're going to send a, we're going to do an A pick. Oh, we need to uh, get exclusive access to the A pick on this core. Then we're going to send a 4,500, I think. The C is all but self. The four is, yeah, we are sending a 4,500. And we're going to uh, constify these things in one second when we prove that this works. This is the A pick ID. If our APIC ID is equal to that, continue. Otherwise, we're going to IPI the APIC ID with an OX4500 followed by a sippy sippy. So this is an init followed by a sippy sippy. And that should launch the other cores. Um, now, uh, APIC ID. Oh, APIC ID. There we go. Uh, call the unsafe function. Well, yeah. Very unsafe. All the cores up. <laughs> Fuck yeah. First try. No problem. Okay. Nice. So now what we can do is... To cause generics. <laughs> Oh shit, we're bringing up cores. Hell yeah, we got these cores up and it worked uh, exactly as we expected. And now what I wanna do is, this is gonna do one-time initialization for the whole kernel. Get exclusive, get exclusive access to the APIC. Uh, this we're going to, um, this is going to uh, locate, um, it's gonna be initialize NUMA allocations and bring up all APs. Application processors or all other cores uh, as determined through the ACPI tables. Okay, I'm gonna tab this in just one. That just barely fits. Okay, we'll do this. Uh, we're putting it in its own scope so that the lock gets dropped. And then, yep, get the APIC ID. And then we IPI. We bring up those other cores, and then at this point, what I want to do is I actually want to make a global. Um, uh, here's what I'm going to have. I'm going to have const. Um, yeah, I gotta. I want to hide this, but I want to have the uh, ma the total number of cores. Do I need that? Do I need to know how many cores exist on the system? I think I do. Um, yeah, because the other cores won't know. It won't be invalid to set this. So we'll have uh, const. Um, uh, this is going to have total cores. And this is atomic U32 is equal to atomic U32 new zero. Uh, tracks the total number of cores detected on the system based on ACPI. Uh, starts off as zero. Uh, let's see. Until ACPI is has been parsed, this number will be zero. And you know what? We're gonna we can hide it. We can hide it. We'll put it in ACPI. Uh, actually, yeah, ACPI. Tracks the total number of cores detected on the system until it's been uh, parsed, uh, initialized. This will be zero. Total cores, that's not pub. We'll say pub fn uh, total cores. This is an accessor for that. I'll return to u32. Uh, get the total number of cores present on this system. And then this will have total cores dot load ordering sequentially consistent. And we're gonna assert that this is greater than, oops, uh, let counts is equal to this. Assert uh, counts is greater than zero. Uh, 
total cores not uh, ready until ACPI is initialized. Return the count. And we got to pull those in. Use core uh, sync. Uh, core sync atomic. Atomic U32 ordering. Okay, we're going to pull that up. That allows us to do that. And now we have to program this here. Um, uh, what are we going to do here? Uh, we're going to, at the end of ACPI init, here we have apex total cores dot store apex dot map x x dot len unwrap or one uh, ordering sequentially consistent. So this is going to be uh, set the total core count based on the number of detected apex on the system. If no Apex were mentioned by ACPI, then we can simply say there is only one core, right? So we're going to get the length and then as U32, um, unwrap over that. Mm, mm. Mmm, this. Mmm, this. There we go. That's better. Okay. Apex.map x.len as ref map. Get the length. Set the total number of cores. And then I can add another pub fn wait for all cores. And this is a, uh, creates a new, oh, we can't, uh, we need a global if we want to do that. Um, yeah. Okay. So I want to prevent the other cores from running, I think, until all of them are up. Well, actually, the BSP... So we're doing this because we had issues with soft reboot where it would init cores that were dead. Uh, it would init cores that aren't present. Oh, and we probably actually just want to store all of the cores on the system in a global such that we can get it back. So when we init them all, we can just send that message. Um, yeah, so I, I think I want to store the, the vector I created of all the cores. Um, I want to get the total, I want to get all the cores that are present. And then based on that, um, hmm. We can get the total number of cores. <laughs> um. Yeah, I think I do want to track which ones. So I'm probably gonna have. Oh, and that's not const. That's static. God, I always do that shit. You know, I really hate, I really hate that if you do const, it'll just make a copy of it, and it'll, like, silently work. Actually, like, that has fucked me up so many times. Let's make sure we're not doing that anywhere else. I don't think we are. Looks like we're good. Okay, sweet. Um, yeah, I do want to track all the cores for when I init them down. Mm. 
let's see. Um, track cores. Yeah, let's get the static apex. There's gonna be an atomic pointer to a um, U32 uh, option. Hmm. What what is this gonna be? I can't dynamically size it. Fuck. Um. I might just do options. Maybe I'll do bulls. I think Rust can pack bulls. Maybe it can't. Uh, bulls and rust are U8s, I think. So we'll do bulls for 1024. And this will be equal to an atomic pointer new uh, core pointer null mute. Yeah, we're, uh, we're going to track the, um, we're going to track all the apex on the system. And then if we pull any down... Uh, we'll be able to clear them out of here. So this will, um, uh, the index specifies the, uh, this is the, um, list of all valid apex on the system. Uh, we're rarely going to use this, so I don't care about the performance of this. I'd rather just, um, I mean, I could, I could store the length. Nah, I like this because this is just one store, and then it's good good forever. What happens if you have more than 1024 cores? It'll, get, it'll just panic in a pretty meaningful way, and then it'll just up the number. Uh, list of all valid apics on the system. Um, present, uh, the apic ID is the index into the list. The uh, bool indicates if the uh, APIC is present or not. That's trying to be funny, but good to know. Yeah, uh, that is, a uh, a thousand cores. Well, you can't get a thousand cores on, uh, x86 yet. So, there's actually not a single x86 machine that this would fail on. The most amount of cores that you can get right now, I think, is, uh, 56 times 2 times 8. So, uh, pushing the, like, 800 limit. I think it's like 850 cores. So probably, I think, probably in like two years, I think we'll be able to see uh, 1024 core, um, 20, uh, 1024 core uh, x86 machines, which will be pretty interesting. So we'll grab an atomic pointer. Bam. Okay, so Apex, never used. Great. Uh, total cores. And then uh, Apex. Uh, let mute Apex is equal to a box new uh, false 1024 uh, Apex.store. Um, apex, uh, box into raw, ordering sequentially consistent. So this will, um, this should work. It's just not doing anything. Yep. Use alloc box box. 197 returns apex. Oh, we, we shadowed that. Uh, this is a uh, valid apex is equal to this. Uh, for apic ID in uh, if let sum. I think I will want to create that box regardless, but it'll be uh, all of them will be false if we don't have any apex. And we'll say uh, create the bool map of valid apic IDs. And then if apic ID, uh, if let sum apix is equal to apix ref for apic ID in apix 
valid apix apic id is true uh this and then uh store the valid apic table into the global bam uh, this is valid apix bam as a u size ref that as a u size on that okay so now we store the valid apix so we permanently have that all of the information that we actually extracted uh, from the system or from acpi is now stored in global so we'll always have access to it uh, we don't have to reparse anything now what i want to do is i actually want to write a fence before i enable interrupts so at this point well the problem we were having before is we were initting cores while while they were launching Um, hmm, what I might want to do is, um, when an APIC comes online, I might throw this in the APIC thing. I'm going to, mm, Use a state flag, of like online, offline. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. Um, struct apic state um, online uh, init um, launched. And online launched and offline. So this, dude, you're totally right, Napalm, thanks for that. Um, the, core ha the core has been launched and has checked in. Uh, the core has uh, checked in with the kernel and is actively running. Uh, the core has been launched by the kernel and is pending uh, and is uh, the core has been launched by the kernel but has not yet registered with the uh, with the kernel and this is uh, the apic is present, but uh, has not yet been launched. And this is none. Uh, the APIC does not exist. This APIC does not exist. OK. And OK, so this is uh, different states for uh, apix to be in the car is checked in with the kernel blah blah, blah. apic doesn't exist and i know i'm mixing core and apic in this case that the core has been launched the core is present the core does not exist uh we'll say the apic id does not exist the core is present but has not been launched uh, different states for Apex to be in, and then we'll have um, and I might want them to check in when they're offline for this to be really, really correct. So I'll launch one when I'm waiting for them to come up. If the kernel if the BSP panics while it's bringing them up, we got a we got a big problem. Um, I don't think I can partially bring up the cores because I could potentially have a no. Actually, if I make sure I don't have any locks held, I think we're fine. The current issue we have is we're a knitting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
So this will be apic state. Um, this. Uh, apic state. Uh, did that fit in one line? No, it didn't. Okay. Apic state null pointer. Okay. Online. Oh, enum. Apex state, 220, valid apex is equal to, let's see, uh, valid apex. In this case, uh, it's not bools. This will be apex state um, offline. And then in this case, apex state none, nice. We're going to have to derive a uh, clone and copy for these. Okay. Um, offline. Okay, so we mark all of those as offline. And then what we're going to do is um, set that our core is online. So we'll do valid apex core apic ID is equal to apic state, uh, and that's a function, apic state online. So the core that launched this is online. As a use size, perfect. Okay, so our core will be marked as online. Those will be marked as offline. And then, yeah, that's pretty fucking cool. So then cores will check in. In fact, I might have them all check in in a common path, potentially. Are you using a language server with Vim? I am not. I've never been a fan of language servers. Not really my cup of tea. Um, okay, so we store the state of those Apex. We then... Launch all those cores. We want to change the states. And to do that, we will um, well, I can actually make that pub because it's unsafe to create the pointer. This one will keep static so that you can't change that. But this one, you won't be able to change this um, unless you use unsafe. You won't be able to access or change it. So then what we're going to do is we're going to mark before we launch one. We're going to say that they're launched. So we're going to say uh, ACPI apix.load ordering sequentially consistent. Uh, let apex is equal to this, and we'll just do some unsafe shit, just for now. Um, otherwise, so core zero will come through and do that, and then this, um, actually we'll do a, a pub fn check-in. Um, this will be core check-in. This will be uh, check in that the check in that the current core has booted. Okay. Then in this case, we will uh, get apex. Uh, apex is dot load ordering sequentially consistent. That gives us a pointer. And let apex is equal to mute deref that. Um, I guess this is unsafe. Well, it's actually safe because the apic ID cannot be modified in the core structure. Um, and then we know that we're only updating one location in that. 
Actually, can I update that safely? I think I might need to put locks on all of these things. I might lock this whole thing then. Yeah, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna uh, we're probably gonna put a lock on this thing. Um, because I can't I can't safely modify one of those fields. Because I can't guarantee that there's no contention on it. Shit. Uh, okay. This is going to hold the apex state, which is an atomic U8. And this is a repper U8. Atomic U8. Okay. Um, boop, boop, boop. The apex ID is the index into the array. The array entry atomic u8 is the um uh converted representation representation of a uh is the u8 representation representation of a an apic state enum and in this case we'll just we'll just mark them with things to Three. It doesn't matter what these values are. I don't want to have zero just for funsies. Uh, 231. Here. This will be as a U8. This will be an atomic U8 new. Apex state none as U8. Here we're going to have offline. Uh, let's see. So we've got the offline as U8 here. Uh, dot store ordering sequentially consistent. So we'll mark that that is offline. And then in this case, we'll store that it's online for the current core ordering sequentially consistent. Okay. Beautiful. So then here, this little core check in. Um, here, we'll do this. Unsafe. Actually, we'll, yeah, core check in. Check in that the core has booted. And, uh, okay, check in that the current core has booted. We're going to get access to this structure. Then, we're going to apex core apic id dot store uh actually comp uh i want to do the compare exchange here um atomic u8 in this case, an atomic U8, we're gonna um, compare and swap current and then the new and swap with ordering, uh, oops, the apic states. The old state should be launched. The new state should be online. And this will be ordering sequentially consistent. We're going to uh, let old state is equal to this. And then here we're going to assert old state is equal to apex state launched as u8 uh, double um, invalid uh, core state transition. Valid core state transition. So this will be uh, get access to the apex. This we're going to uh, transition from launched to online. 
and this will uh, make sure that we only ever go from launched to online any other transition is invalid and then at that point we've checked in 48 cannot be indexed that's a, as a u size so we'll do this Um, apic ID, that's a function. Oh, U size. Bam. Okay, then here we're going to assert apix is not null. And this will say uh, apix uh, core check in without apix initialized and then let apix is equal to uh, mute deref apix how is that built oh we haven't gotten to safety checks that's unsafe and that will require unsafe which is good uh, 63 uh, we won't do that yet perfect okay so that's unsafe Nice, 235. Copy is not implemented for that. Oh, shit. God damn it. Oh. This is a really annoying limitation of Rust. Um. <sighs> Copy is not implemented for that, so we can't. Fuck, I was not expecting that. I'm surprised Atomic U8 doesn't have copy implemented. It has a default. But I can't do this, I don't think. And I can't do box new default default. Uh, in this case, box um, atomic u8 for 10.24. There's no default for that because it's too large. Fuck. Fuck. Can you add a copy implementation? No, not on a type that I I don't control. You son of a bitch. Son of a bitch. I have to do this then. Vec new. Uh, vec with capacity 1024. Oh, kill me. Vec atomic U8 uh, for this in zero dot dot. So annoying. Uh, let's see. Const max cores uh, u size is equal to 1024. Uh, maximum number of cores allowed on the system. Max cores. Okay. 1024. Max cores. Max cores. Valid apix dot push atomic u8 new apix state none as u8 okay valid apix 
And then here we're doing some unsafe shit. As mute pointer. Oh, and how do we drop that? Uh, vec. As mute pointer, and then we have to, yeah, um, mean we drop. Okay. Standard mem size of manually drop vec manually drop new this. Push those, then we can as mute pointer that. Expected, and here we can cast this. We can cast that from an array of 1024 to that safely in this case. 255 uh, as mute. 237. Back. Oh, uh, manually drop. Well, you know, we don't actually need to strongly type this because it will figure that one out for us. Okay. Woof. -da. Now, in APIC, I think we have some 1024s somewhere. Um, that's an MM. So this will be uh, use create ACPI max cores. Max cores, max cores. Okay, done. Uh, 37. What? Thirty-seven. Store box into raw. Expected max cores. Found max cores. Wh what? 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 Question mark? Oh, it's private. Ah, that's why. Pub. I was wondering if that was that. Okay, uh, ACPI is no longer used in box. Okay. So, on a core check-in, we get access to that, we fill in the APIC ID as a U size. we compare and swap from launch to online, and then we assert that we only go from launch to online. Okay. Whew. Okay, um, this will do, uh, set core state, unsafe, um, and this will, uh, set the current execution state of a given core, uh, a given APIC ID, uh, yeah, we'll set, set core state, APIC ID U32. This one's unsafe. Same shit here. And we're just gonna forcibly store it. And this will take an APIC state. Pub that. And this will take, we'll store the state as U8, ordering sequentially consistent, and this is uh, 
up force forcibly update the state of the core. Okay, so get access to the Apex, and then we do that. So now we have an unsafe, and here we'll do set ACPI set core state Apex ID Apex state launched. Okay. And ACPI Apex state launched. Okay. Okay, uh, unnecessary unsafe here. Okay. Oh, APIC ID. It's not the current APIC. Oh. Old state. Yep. Oh, we can. Oh, wow. Should probably read the code that I'm writing. Uh, is null, load that. If it's not null, okay, this. Now we say that that core is launched. Uh, mark the core as launched. And this is um, launch the core. And then here, I'm gonna do ACPI core check-in. And this is gonna panic because the BSP Nice, invalid. Okay, so if I do else, this will not panic. Beautiful. So that, we'll do that, and then we can do um, pub fn get core states apic id u32 apic states uh, gets the apic state for a uh, given uh, apic id. core check into set core state. Can you delegate it? Um, not necessarily, because this one does a compare and swap. This one requires that it goes from launch to online, whereas this one just overwrites it. Um, I could potentially make like a, an accessor for the Apex that's unsafe and then use that, but it's uh, such a small amount of uh, code share that it's not worth making another function. The, the overhead of making the new function exceeds the uh, code duplication in that case. Okay, so we're going to uh, get the core state. Well, now we're getting to that stage. <laughs> get access to the Apex. In this case, we don't need mutable access. And we will get Apex, um, Apex ID as U size, uh, get the apic state. Oh, this one we actually need to match this load ordering sequentially consistent. And then we need to perform these conversions because we have a U8 and we're gonna convert that U8 into these others. So we're gonna say apic state launched as U8, apic state launched. Once again, a little wart in Rust. Um, S launched with online G. S launched uh, offline. S launched and uh, none G. Okay. Oh, and we can't do that, can we? F fucking hell. <sighs> yeah. Really stupid. Um, Repr U8 on enum? I have it, Repr U8. Can you convert it over? Can you ver convert it back? I don't think so, unless that's new. Uh, you can't do this. I wish you could. Um, dot into? I don't think into is auto implemented. 
and I don't think try into gets implemented. Yeah. It's, re it's annoying. It's really annoying. We have to do this. Impl apic states fn from raw. Raw is a u8. Return apic states match raw. Zero turns into an apic state online. Yeah, and we have to do this. It's really fucking stupid. Or we can do ifs. But yeah, I'm not aware of a way in Rust that you can do this without a third party crate, and there really should be. Uh, convert a raw u8 into an apic state. Online launched offline none panic invalid apic state uh, from uh, u8 oh i should actually do uh, from instead uh, impl from u8 for apic state from raw value convert a raw u8 into an apic state okay and this is val Option? What do you mean option? That's just going to panic. It's not... Um... Yeah, it doesn't need to be available. It's never going to be coming from an untrusted source. If you end up using that yourself, then sorry. You, you just... You panicked yourself. You played yourself. Um... <laughs> You played yourself. Here we're going to get the core state, and then here we can do an into. Oh, fuck, yeah, we can. Uh huh. Convert the uh, uh, get the state, current state, and convert it into an apic state. Okay. So now what I can do here is uh, print. I can do this uh, while. ACPI, uh, do I want get core state? No, core state. Core state for this APIC ID, while it's not equal to ACPI APIC state um, offline, which, it, which is wrong. This is just meant to uh, get stuck. Uh... Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yep. Uh, partial EQ and EQ. Beautiful. Okay, so this will bring on one core, and then it doesn't release. Nice. And then while it's not equal to online, boom. Okay. There we go. So this, uh, we'll wait for the core to check in. So here we can do use... ACPI um, APIC states. Oh, is this going to fit one liner? Yes, it does. And this one will as well, I think. Uh, we'll launch the core. And this will wait for the core to come online. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to move all of this into ACPI. Um, honestly, do I just want this to happen on ACPI and NIT? Yeah, I think I'll just have ACPI and NIT and bring up all the other cores. Unless there's something I need to do. Um, I gotta manage my characters in Tibia. Unless there's something that I need to do. Hmm. Do I need to do anything? Um, do I want to enable the cores or do I want ACPI init to just bring the cores online automatically when requested? And I think, I think I'll just have ACPI bring them online. I think that's fine. I don't think I need to delay. So I think we'll do that. Um, 
Doop. Yeah, change it. Do it auto. Yeah, and then change it later. Yeah, I totally agree with that. That's the play. Okay, this. That. This. Okay. Um, all right. Oops. Recording. Stop. Okay, uh, here we go. Uh, yeah, I think we're just gonna bring them all online. Unsafe ACPI init. Um, Get all the apics on the sys. Uh, uh, bring up all apics on the system, and also initialize numa uh, information with the memory manager through the use of the ACPI uh, information. Brump. Nice. That means I can make some of these things non-pub, and I can restrict these. So this doesn't need to be pub. This doesn't need to be pub. Uh, why not? And that needs to be pub. OK. So then down here at the end, bring up all the cores um, we'll do this uh, okay this is um, launch all APs all other cores uh, if let's some valid apix is equal to apix do this We'll move that. All right. That returns nothing. That'll just init. Um, uh, brings up all cores on the system. Uh, 305 APIC. Let's get the APIC. Get exclusive access to the APIC for this core. Done. ACPI, we don't need that. Here we just have APIC state, uh, set core state. And while the core state is not online, so here we'll just spin forever. Unless we have a panic in here, we won't have any issues. And then all the cores will be online when they come through, uh, unnecessary, unsafe, beautiful, decrease more scoping. Uh, and this will go through all Apex on the system. And we don't want to launch ourselves. And then send an init sippy sippy. We'll clean that up. And then total cores. Uh, don't really need that right now, but I think we will have this. Get the total number of cores present on the system. Um, we'll say num cores. Uh, allow unused. That'll just be dead code. Cargo run clean. Cargo run. Okay. Uh, num cores. That's unused, but that's fine. We'll probably eventually want to use that for some, uh, like, uh, locks or like synchronization barriers. Okay, so this will bring up all the cores and I'll print the APIC ID of the core. We don't care. Enable the APIC timer um, and enable interrupts. Okay. Um, initialize the APIC. Do that. Technically, I don't want to allow enabling interrupts before APIC init, so that's something I might want to guard. Let's take a look here. I'm new, my brain will explode. Nah, no exploding brains here, man. 
Okay, uh, let's see if it works on hardware. Woo! And then Core Zero Online. Hell yeah. Beautiful. Okay, um, reboot, core online, reboot, reboot, reboot. Okay, well, if it works on 256 cores, I would say it works, uh, it works for me. Beautiful. Fuck yeah. And we're able to soft reboot that, and let's see what happens if we panic. We'll have one of these cores panic. Uh, if core ID is equal to five, panic, fuck. Um. Uh, do we build it? We did. Oh, <laughs> we don't have five cores on that. We'll do core ID two. If core ID is two, we'll panic. Nice. We're able to soft reboot that. Okay, in this case, we have that panic on another core, and we get that soft reboot, which is good. That panic will happen while we're bringing up other cores, and that will stop us from bringing up more cores. Um, yeah. Oh, so this is borked. And I think this is because I'm sending an init to cores that are already init, potentially. Because that panic happened before all the cores came online. Let's see, for example, is there... Oh, core zero online. Panic reported by another core. Um... Hmm. Not done yet. We got to get this. Um, I don't think that's all 256 online, but core zero did show up. And if core zero printed online, then they're all online. And that panics. Is Core Zero the BSP? Yeah, it's always the BSP. Um, so by that stage, the BSP is fine. We got a panic. And then here, we have this issue. And this issue was when we init cores. I think... Launched. Launch the core online. All the cores will be able to come online. They should be able to do this. Interrupts init, apic init. It's possible that they fail to initialize their interrupts, which means they never got marked as online. Um... And I think this was an issue with, uh, like, this is the same issue we had before, and this was due to a, a delay, and we were having something panic early, and then that caused our init stuff to cause issues. And I think we were, we're getting a, I think we're getting infinite recursion because we tried to initialize I think if we init a core that's already init, it might be uh, a crash. Add a sum four on core check-in. Um, that is fine. Core check-in is fine. So if I get rid of this print and I do a... Um, oh, I got rid of my delay routine. Well, I actually got to go to my meeting. Uh, I'll be back after my meeting, but I'm going to stop the stream. But I'll be back in probably like 30 minutes, hour at most. And then we'll finish this up. All right, see you all in a bit.
Hype. <clears throat> All right, let's get this shit code a little bit while we were hanging out, or while I was doing my meeting, while you guys were hanging out, just chilling. Okay, so I, I read that wrong. Okay, uh, blah, 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 those flags are set. Then we get to this stage. For some reason, and I've I've done a really weird uh, debug. Okay, so that's 86 still, which it should be. And then that transitions during interrupts enabled. Enable interrupts. Okay, so what I did is I, I know roughly where this problem is, and I, I don't quite understand what I did yet. It's probably something really stupid. Um, so what I did is I changed this code here in the timer interrupt to attempt to lock the APIC in a loop. Before it was unwrapping, which would cause a panic. Um, but I'm gonna do a CPU halt here. <clears throat> and we're gonna take a look here. Yeah, so if I do a halt, and you guys can't see this, but my CPU usage, Never mind. I wasn't breaking the loop. Uh, CPU halt. Okay, I, I totally thought that's where I was hitting the contention, but it isn't. So I need to figure out where I'm having this issue. Um, okay, so now we're halted. And I can't reset. Losing control... For some reason, that interrupt handler is not getting triggered again, which is likely due to maybe... I'm... Here we're gonna EOI that. That APIC is always valid. Um, and let's hop over to... Why is that... We're gonna switch over to... I don't get it. I think, I think I'm in a panic loop. If one of these things <clears throat> fails, so here we'll try and get access to the APIC. Panic, oh, um, if I'm panicking, well, I'm not panicking right now, but if I were, were panicking, well, interrupts would be disabled, so I wouldn't hit that. I, I think somehow that EOI is is not getting set up. So, uh, yeah, this is so hard to debug. Oh, I don't get what we broke. Uh, somewhere we're... And we're not deadlocking, we're hitting a halt. And maybe I'm just not getting the prints. Well, I'd be hitting a halt, though. Uh, where are all the places that I can halt? Panic, I can halt on the other cores. Uh, at 91, here I can halt forever, and that kind of lines up that we got past int enable, and then we hit halt, and that feels like timer interrupts are not, yeah, that feels like for some reason the timer interrupts are not coming through. Yeah, for some reason, we're not getting timer interrupts. That's TLDR. That is the root of the problem. This is definitely the halt we're in. And somehow, let's uh, let's print. All right, here we go. Okay, we got this going. This is where we scare it into working by having that print where everything just magically starts working. It should eventually die, I think. Uh, why am I using Rust instead of C and C++? Oh, ints enabled 86. Oh, they're not. They're not enabled. 
Well, I know what the problem... Well, I don't know what the root of the problem is, but I know what a uh, large part of this problem is. Um... So, what, what is the issue here? Somehow, but yeah, the main, the main reason I write this all in Rust is because it's pretty much impossible to write correct C and C++. So, by using Rust, it means that we can make more mistakes uh, and kind of get away with those mistakes not being fatal. Uh, debugging problems is a lot easier. Um, and also, Rust is a, a faster language to develop in, and it's nicer to write some of these high-level constructs, having things like iterators, uh, not having to automatically, being able to automatically free things when they go out of scope, not having deadlocks, or not having um, race conditions is really nice. <clears throat> so there are a bunch of different features I love. I want to print the, so when we get into core locals, enable interrupts, if we're not in an interrupt, does that think we're in an interrupt? Core in interrupt. Does that think we're in an interrupt for some reason? Oops, that's a function. Okay, now we have to wait for this to die. Does x86 not have nested interrupts? It does have nested interrupts. Uh, x86 interrupts, okay, false. Not in interrupt, okay. Now let's check the interrupt disable outstanding. Let's take a look here. I'm going to make this pub temporarily, and we're going to print that. This is the level of interrupt dot load. Okay, I will load that up. Oh, and we don't have that in the scope. Core, atom uh, core sync atomic. So this will get the current level, and I'm curious if this is like negative one or something. It starts out as one. Here we decrement it. Enable interrupts. Decrement by one. And we'll do, I think I can print here. Uh, no, I can't, I can definitely not print there because that, that would recurse. Um, if we're not in an interrupt and OS is one, then this. Disable interrupts. I can do this. Print disable request. I think I should be able to do this. Um, uh, print. Oh, ordering matters on these. Oh, yeah, those are in a... Uh, I see. Yeah, I can't print in this. Okay, so... RG disable interrupts. What calls this? Locks call that? Tool chains in Rust is a bitch to get work in. How are you building a kernel with it? I actually don't really have any problems with the Rust tool chain. It's never really been an issue for me. Um, it's always worked kind of exactly as I expected, which is... Pretty sweet, to be honest. Okay, core locals. Enter lock. Disable. Yeah, what, it, what is your issue with the Rust tool chain? Okay, so the only place that we disable interrupts is in a panic handler up here, which we're not in. Or a lock. And this would indicate... that it's possible 
to grab a lock and not release it. Uh, we're going to go up to all of these stages. Core check-in. Okay, why is that two? We'll print this very early. Uh, we'll yoink these. This is right after we init the A pick. And then we'll see when this dies. How is that starting at two? Um, let's take a look here. A, -A, -A. this is right after core lo huh? Um, seem to be a wizard to me writing code and assembly. It's just what we do here. Love it. It's all nice here. Uh, a, -A, -A. In ins enabled false two. Some. And then how is this ever working then? Interrupt disable outstanding. Interrupt disable outstanding. It starts off at one. Here to disable interrupts, we add one. And then we check to add that. Um. Let's see. And that calls unsafe disable interrupts. This will subtract one. That starts at one. Lock. That does nothing. The dummy lock. Allocate. We get to this stage. Interrupt disable outstanding. We write in that GS base. And then somehow, when we get to here, it's two. Well, that would explain why none of this makes sense. Because that doesn't make sense. How is that two? Uh, this is going to be right in core. We're going to say uh, core ins enabled in interrupt. We can't print in here. Fuck. Uh, but that's right after we initialize core locals. Directly after. How is this ever working? One day Wikipedia will have our dark theme. My life will be complete. Yeah, we can we can put it. We can just do that. We'll send it. We'll send it here. All right, there you go. There's your dark theme. Um, cores up. AAA ins enabled false two. How do I set something to a one? How does that become a two between this, the right set GS base? Uh, I am dumbfounded. How does that work? Disable interrupts, set to one. And then here we load it. Uh, what does the core macro do? Get core locals. That doesn't acquire a lock. How does a one get added? I'm just going to halt here. Th 
What? How is that a two? How is that even remotely a two? We'll get rid of all these args. Oh, because we're in a print. Oh, it's because we're in a print. We get the print lock before we print that. Okay. 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 Back to the original point then. Um, now, so if it's one, interrupt should get enabled. Okay, so here, ints enabled, false one. That means interrupt should have gotten enabled, and they didn't get enabled. And why didn't they get enabled? Enable interrupts here. Core locals, exit lock here, enable interrupts, get outstanding, so there are some circumstances where that's not getting enabled, let's, what? I'm printing 86 false 1, and that means that that is currently 0. Um, okay, let's int out. This is the interrupts outstanding. We yoink this whole thing. Let's see what we get here. Boop. Int out. Int out. All right. So that should print a zero when it fails at the end. And then we can replace the other. This is before. We can get rid of this one. We'll reset. Okay, so this interrupts enabled is now the actual number. False one. Uh, and this is, what is this? This is at like pre-spin. Pre-spin, false one. Here we go. Interrupts enabled, false zero. And we're not getting the interrupt. And interrupts are masked. What? So we call enable interrupts. It was zero. Or it was one. It got decremented to zero. And somehow we didn't enable interrupts. Oh, we can't do flags like that. Uh, let flags is equal to, I keep debating myself. We're getting the real jibates. All right, here we go. Uh, flags. We need the flags prior to the print. Same thing in this case. And this is uh, pre-spin. Okay, now this one. Okay, sweet. We got stuck and interrupts are enabled. Uh, oh, wait. Let's do the loop thing. Let's get to the point that it stops working. Once it breaks, unless it's not breaking now. And then some, uh, there's an assembly instruction to enable interrupts. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. Okay, okay, here's where it's stuck. Sweet, this means Yeah, this is stuck. Okay, and interrupts are enabled, and we're stuck, and we're not getting that interrupt. And... I 
I think that likely means that I am um, in that situation. So the question is, am I, I'm not deadlocked. I'm on a halt. And the halt that I'm at is pre-spin enabled, ins enabled. Whoa. How does that happen? How is that? What? Pre-spin. Bootloader starting. Ins enabled. What? 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 I'm just gonna halt here before I enable interrupts. Chocolate milk, ins enabled. Okay, reboot it. What is going on? Chocolate milk bootloader starting. Ins enabled false two. BSP up cores up. Oh, I didn't rebuild it. Let's just make sure that's rebuilt. No, that's not it. Well, now's where I get very confused. I'm doing something incredibly stupid. Um, how am I printing ins enabled? Oh my god, I have an earlier print. Oh, I still have an early print. Oh my god. Whoops. I was like, okay. Okay. Whew. Uh, print. How many prints do I have? BSP up. Cores up. Don't need those. Pre-spin enabled. Okay, it's literally just those two. It's just those two prints now. Okay. Woof. Enable and disable interrupts, Phoenix. We're just debugging an issue right now. We don't understand what's. Uh, we seem to have some bug, and we don't. We don't really know what it is. But it's not. It's not that. Uh, what? It, oh, we got stuck. Okay, ins enabled false zero. Nice. Uh, let's see. Let's now check the APIC register. I might print that off the APIC. This LVT timer register. Yeah, when we get to this stage, let's unwrap. And then I should have a read. Read APIC. Uh, pub on safe FN. Read APIC. And we're going to read at. The timer, which is at 320. Do you have debugger access here, Colonel? I do not. Um, lock as mute. Hey.
mom. Oh, dot, dot. There we go. Alright, so this will eventually fail. There we go. Okay, here is the timer LVT entry. We've got the EO2 up here. And let's take a look at the LVT entries. I think this is correct, unfortunately. Whoa. Oh, two means it's a uh, periodic mode. Okay, so the that is currently set up as in the periodic mode. <clears throat> no offense, your code is a mess. You should spend more time making it more readable. Uh, that's why we're writing test code because we're trying to we're trying to debug a problem right now. Code is plenty readable here, but not for the test code that we're writing. Okay, let's take a look here. Um, 2000E0, and we're gonna go, and we'll forcefully EOI this APIC. I'm really curious if that's what's happening. And if we EOI that, and then it works. If we see that print, and then we see, okay, we got this going. Oh, oh, oh. It's EOI. How is that? So what is the possible condition where I end up resetting the processor without EOIing? See, that's what I don't get. I, I have, so that clearly fixed it, right? We were able to continue and then we got the interrupts back through here. Um, Enable the timer here. And how do I... Delivery... Uh, I was expecting to see the delivery status potentially set. So how do I know if I need to EOI? Is there a bit I can see if it's in that? Uh, there, then interrupt from the source has been delivered uh, to the processor core but has not yet been accepted. Okay, so that's not it. What's EOIing? It's marking the end of an interrupt. Um, so effectively, in this case, the APIC won't deliver another interrupt while, uh, while that is set. I wonder... We enable the timer here. Dude, that's so weird. Like clearly that's the issue. And I don't understand how I can potentially have an interrupt, except for if I have a panic. If I have a panic, it's possible I don't EOI it. I could, can I see the EOI function on the APIC? Uh, I do it when I get the um, timer. On a timer interrupt, I will EOI. Is it because I'm doing that before? I don't think so. I don't think there's a race on EOI because it shouldn't, it, it shouldn't deliver. Well, now we're getting that a lot. Oh yeah, because in this case we're soft rebooting and we're not sending the EOI. Yep, so this time it's always failing. That makes sense because we're uh, soft rebooting before we EOI. And then in this case, I send an EOI before allowing a soft reboot. And we go back to this, but then eventually one slips through the cracks 
right like that where somehow okay I don't I don't get how I Okay, that's a little spewy. Okay, I'm holding Z. Okay, uh, pause. So here's what I care about. Somehow, uh, Okay, I actually think the documentation. Let's take a let's take a look here. Um, I'm gonna disable when I. I always EOI that. Interrupts are masked while I'm in here, unless somehow they're getting unmasked, which I don't think is the case. But that that would be a possible. A failure case is if somehow interrupts are getting enabled while in this stage. Uh, CPU flags. Do you have another implementation that works? In this case, this is this is not like a misunderstanding. Um, it's just like something. I probably have like a couple things mixed up. Um, and unfortunately, it's just it's going to be a very specific bug to this. And it's unlikely that I would notice anything by looking at a reference implementation. Uh, what I think is happening, attempt soft reboot 86. OK, so in this example, so basically what's happening here is we're doing a soft reboot. And somehow that, somehow we need to EOI that APIC. And what I suspect. I am dropping that APIC right now, unless I'm not. Let me check in panic. This will cause the APIC to get dropped. I'll knit all of the cores. This is a little kludgy right now, but that's fine. Soft reboot this. I wonder if that timer's not getting disabled. The time I think the timer might not be getting disabled. It's weird because I disabled the APIC. So um, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna look at the um, this is when we disable the APIC and this is in drop. Uh, print uh, drop. Uh, I don't think that's going to work. I think that'll deadlock. Oh, we are seeing drop. Okay. How is... Oh, because we're not in a panic. Um, so we should print... We should be able to print here unless we're in a panic. Uh, in this case, we're going to disable the... Or we're going to software disable the APIC. And then we're going to take a look at the LVT entry for the timer. Um... TLVT. All right, let's take a look at this. What do we got here? Yeah, that's got the three. And three means that's masked. Um, right. Pretty sure three means masked. Well, the one means, uh, so we got the LVT timer, we got the APIC timer, blah, blah, blah. I don't care about that. I care about where the, local APIC, do, 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 here we go, these, um, yeah, three is these two bits set, which is periodic mode with, that is masked. 
So that is correct. Uh, we are masking that. I actually, that might uh, general protection fault. It might not honor that register. Let's uh, reset. Okay, so we're still hitting this. And I don't know. Uh, CPU flags. Let's see what the flags are looking like there. It, it feels like interrupts are getting enabled somehow. Okay, so here's a failure case. Interrupts are enabled. That's not masked. So interrupts are enabled. That's not masked off. But we need the EOI. I don't get it. So I don't know if we can EOI when the APIC is disabled, but we're going to EOI right here. And that's really close. So the, the race window is tiny there. And we're still getting it frequently. So that means something in the... This means that something in like the somehow EOI somehow we're getting an interrupt and I don't know if it's related to the timer. So I'm going to explicitly disable the timer interrupt by uh, we'll disable the timer by writing the initial count to zero. And we're going to see if this is it. Um, nope, and that's still, that's still giving us problems. I, I don't. <clears throat> so somehow the... Somehow the processor, we EOI here. Well, you know, we'll EOI after disabling the timer, right? Why not? So we'll disable the timer, we'll EOI, and let's see what we get here. Let's see if this ever fails, and it does. What? Um, no idea what the issue is, but basically we're disabling the timer. We then EOI, then we disable the APIC entirely, and then we go do a soft reboot. And someone during the boot process, not us, some firmware some firmware is enabling interrupts and interrupt is coming through unless somehow we're enabling interrupts here but i don't think we are ah that's so strange uh yep okay so we're going to and the timer interrupt okay when we initialize the apic Software enable, set spurious. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna EOI that right off the bat. We're gonna enable that and then we're gonna EOI it. 
And I... Uh, Pre-spin enabled it. This is never going to get to the... Um, We don't see the attempt soft reboot or the drop. Okay, what? All right, here we go. Oh, I, I got rid of those prints, that's why. Okay, so this is always working. If I stop, eventually it'll roll over, but this is, okay, pre-spin enabled, and that's still scrolling. Like, I can do that as a precaution, but it's just strange to me. There's, like, some someone is not EOIing the APIC, probably in that, like, Pixie firmware. This is really bizarre. Like th this, this fix works, right? Um, this does fix it, but I don't think it's. Owned. But I don't. Basically, I think I think something in like the the bootloader stack in one of the int ten or one of the int fifteens or in the pixie stack, someone's enabling interrupts. Which makes sense, because in the network stack, they might enable interrupts. And they're not EOIing. They're not EOIing something. And then, so what I can do is I can just EOI immediately when I, when I enable the APIC. Uh, I can just EOI. And that's what I've been doing, and that fixes the issue. But I'm just not confident about that, right? So this is without the EOI. I get these random interrupts, which is basically showing that it gets stuck. Um, and if I EOI it, I don't have that problem. Ah, that just makes no sense. I, yeah, wondering if old uh, pick interrupts need to be EOI. I do, think, I do think it is something outside of our control, right? I don't think this is our fault. Um, because we EOI all of our interrupts. We EOI all of our interrupts, and, and I proved that uh, when you were gone. Um, when you were gone, I explicitly, in my drop handler, I, uh, like, disabled my timer vector. I EOI'd, and then I disabled the APIC, and then I rebooted. And I was getting, um, uh, it soft rebooted. And then I would see that it would come back online with EO, uh, with needing to send EOI, which means somewhere between soft reboot and when I got execution again, someone had an interrupt come through, which is not me because I have uh, interrupts disabled in my my entire stack. So one of the somewhere one of the features uh, enables interrupts. Or doesn't EOI. Oh, you know what? I bet. Let me see. I bet that since I enable the X2 A pick, something uses the pick. Yeah, so this this will fail every once in a while. Um, I think since I enable X2 A pick, something gets an interrupt. And then they try to EOI it using the a, uh, the X APIC, and since we're in X2 APIC mode, that doesn't fly. Let's check this out. Let's see. That's what it is. I bet it since we're changing the uh, mode of the APIC. All right, here we go. Let's see if we ever get one of those prints. Oh, we do. Okay, so that's not it. Why does it say E1000 EDP stack? Well, that's what we were going to be doing, but we're uh, we're debugging some issues right now. Um Okay, so So, I mean I can just do this. I can just fresh EOI and here here's what we're going to do uh here we'll uh, disable the APIC. 
So the first thing we'll do is we'll disable the APIC by writing a zero, uh, or software disable the APIC. Uh, and sh this will cause all interrupts to get masked. And then we can enable it. And then we'll EOI. And then at that point, we know that EOI is cleared. Uh, everything is masked. Yeah, disable it, software disable the APIC. That'll cause everything to get masked. Software enable the APIC. Set up our spurious vector. Unless we're getting a spurious, spurious interrupt, and for some reason, it's not going through on FF. Which could be possible, but I don't think that's the case. So this should always succeed. Oh yeah, some dude, uh, yeah, we're planning to write a driver for uh, the E1000. NMIs will still come through. Yeah, I mean, NMIs are fine because, uh, I mean, nothing should be sending NMIs. If we get an NMI, it's, it's game over. Um, I don't think I have NMIs blocked. No, not at that stage. That'll only be in my interrupts, on my NMI handler. Okay. Does VMI power off send an NMI? It does not. Pretty much nothing sends an NMI except for, uh, like, it, unless you kind of program something to send an NMI. Like, you, you program a vector uh, to do that. Okay. So, we're going to fresh EOI because we don't know what state the APIC could have been in. That doesn't need to be mute. All right. We're going to take a look here and see if this ever gets stuck. So all this shit can go away. Okay, so that's working. So, bring up all the cores. We make sure we EOI that, and let's try this on hardware then. Uh, I think both hardware, We I think we broke both pieces of hardware, so uh, we'll reset the Phi, Phi's reset, and then the other, we'll get that other one reset as well. Um, am I using QMU? Uh, kind of, in some of, the, in some of these. Technically, I'm using QMU KVM for the VM, so kind of, but not like directly using QMU. Okay, so both of those are coming back up. And then this we can print. Okay, and then I'll just print a um, print a core this up. Uh, and then the RDTSC uh, core ID CPU RDTSC. Okay, so that's what it'll look like. Oh, that gets stuck. Okay, so I won't bring up the other cores. So there's still something broken there. Wait. Actually, how is this? I can't even reset this. And that is the... Okay, so this one is up. Okay. And that's working like that. Okay, so this is single core. I'm gonna, just going to hold Shift Z, keep rebooting it. So work on the APIC issue. Um, this, yeah, this is a slightly different issue. I think I fixed this issue. I think. I still might not want to init all the other cores. Um, well, let's see. So let's get that file and reset. I don't know why that's not getting reset. Anyways, so this is working consistently. And if I wait, Z, 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 hold down Z. Okay, so that seems to be working quite well. So we're going to bring up all the cores. Z. Okay. 
and this is not getting stuck. So that looks, this looks stable. So that would suggest that that issue is fixed. Potentially. And then I stopped and then we'll try it again. Okay, so that seems to be pretty reliably working. I'm just waiting for this server to come up. I don't know. I actually don't know why this is not rebooting. Yeah, I actually don't know why this server is not coming up. All right, we reset that. Oh, my session timed out and it just let me try to reboot it and it just didn't do anything. Okay. Nice. All right, we'll reset. There we go. <laughs> you can almost say all the cores and it's just four cores. <laughs> Okay, so that, and then let's try this VM to reset that, get a new bootloader. Okay. Okay, this is not getting stuck. Uh, cool. This seems to always be working. It's still buffering characters, and then Z, 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 Z. Okay, so that's not getting stuck. And then let's try a panic. Uh, if core ID is two, panic by. And before I build that, I want the phi to come up so I can test this on there. Because I kind of have two soft reboot paths. I have the soft reboot path, which is uh, through an inner uh, through a panic. So if a panic occurs, that soft reboot. And then I also have a soft reboot through the timer interrupt, which is what I'm testing right now. And this is working fine, at least on four cores and in the VM on four cores. No problem. Re reliably working. Okay, uh, this is real hardware. That's a shift Z, shift Z, shift Z. And I'm holding shift Z, which is pretty much as uh, difficult as it can possibly be on this. Uh, yeah, and it's having no problems. So that has some buffered... Uh, okay, Z. That's not getting stuck. That's not getting stuck. This isn't getting stuck. Okay, that's working. And let's try this again. Like, this is a, this is a pretty aggro test. And it seems to be working, which is... I'd say a pretty good sign. <clears throat> All right, let's test the panic side of it. So let's make sure the hardware, okay, hardware stable. I'm gonna do this a couple more times. But yeah, that seems really stable actually. Is there a list of bugs that you found? I do not have a list of bugs that I've found. Well, technically I do on my offline network. But I don't have a public list of all the bugs I've found. Uh, I think publicly I've only found like a, uh, I have a couple CVEs, some of my Microsoft work. Okay, so we're gonna change that to do a panic. There we go, panic, Z, Z. So this is testing panics and that gets stuck. Okay, and that, I think that is getting stuck. Um, I think that gets stuck because we're not waiting for the processors to get torn down. So if one of the processors is coming up and we set the init and maybe the init is getting dropped by that core. Uh, 
I'm curious where this is um, getting stuck. It's probably infinite recursion due to like a panic in the panic handler. And we'll try and bang out this bug. Oh, nice. That is at 100% CPU. Uh, let's reset this. Okay, here. Z. Oh yeah, this will spin at 100% CPU because this won't halt. Yeah, in the panic handler we can't halt. But this eventually gets stuck. And there we go, it got stuck. Uh, course up. And we never get the panic, which is interesting. And let's see, what's our path to panic? Panic. Oh, um... Yeah. That's because we send an NMI when a core panics to the BSP. And the BSP uh, is, is in the ACPI init stage. Yeah, if I do this, this should like fail much easier. Like much more frequently this should fail. In fact, this might never work. Nice. That's what I like to see. Okay, this permanently never works. Okay, so the reason I think for this is that uh, we're causing a panic on core two. And remember, we are, we're, we're booting up cores in a ACPI init and we're launching them up. And then the cores come flying through here and one of them panics while this one's, this panics, that sends an NMI. And then that is in currently in ACPI init yeah, yeah, and this is, this is currently launching the cores right here. So it has the A pick. We have the lock on the A pick. Um, and yeah, we basically we we break the whole system because if we have an NMI come in here, we panic. We then have to get the A pick lock because we have to be able to init ourselves. Uh, we have to init everything to tear everything down. So I think the APIC lock is the only requirement of panic, if I'm not mistaken. Panic requires um, Yeah, panic will recursively panic if we can't get the APIC lock. So we can either shatter that lock or we can prevent multiple cores uh, or we can prevent that NMI um, while our APIC is locked. We basically have to prevent other cores from releasing. Well, here we're waiting for them to get online. And they'll come online and they'll check in. I think what I'll do is I will have on the core check-in. Yeah, this is what I'm going to do. On core check-in. So if they don't check in, um, if they don't check in, it's a big problem. Um, but they could potentially not check in and crash. So I think... It's kind of hard to think about how I want to describe that. Um, how I how, basically, if they don't check in, we're gonna have issues, and we're gonna go into ACPI and where we do a core check in. What this is gonna do is we're going to uh, static cores online atomic U size or atomic U32. What do we have for total cores? It's a, atomic U32. Um, is equal to atomic u32 new one uh, number of cores which have checked in. The BSP is assumed to be checked in. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is we're going to make sure that transition occurred, and then here 
um, wait for all cores to be online before continuing. Yeah, I guess maybe we should just shatter that lock. Because otherwise, in theory, if another core panics while we have the APIC lock on the BSP, we're going to have issues. Yeah, we're going to do that. We're going to implement shatter. That's the correct way. It's the correct way. Okay. So this catastrophically fails every time. This never works. Perfect. Yep. Every time it doesn't even get to the core prints and we don't see the panic. And that's because we're getting an NMI while we have the APIC lock. Now what we need to do is we need to make the interrupt handler. If an NMI comes in, what happens? That's fine. That's fine. This will cause a panic if we have an NMI. So that's where we uh, bink off and we'll go right into panic. We hit panic and then here we have to get access to the APIC and I think we're going to shatter that. Kernel source um, this is the last, uh, like, hard to debug bug. From this point on, it should be smooth sailing. Like, when we implement the network stack, all the bugs are going to be, like, clean panics and prints. Uh, it's just getting the core, the core all together. This is not the last bug. This is the last hard to debug bug. Okay, um, this is going to be a uh, pub fn um, unsafe fn get mute. Uh, we'll call this shatter self lock cell guard. Uh, fuck it, we'll just return a mutable reference to the internal type t. Uh, actually, we'll do uh, mute t. And this will uh, return a raw pointer to the internal locked value regardless of the lock state. Obvious, uh, this bypasses the lock, the lick, the lock, self dot, uh, cell dot get. That'll get us a mutable on that. Oops. Uh, self dot. What is it? Val. So do self dot value dot get. That gives a mute T. Okay. And that means when we get to panic, in the case of our normal soft reboot, we don't have to do this. But in this case, this will get us access to the APIC. We're going to init all the other cores. Uh, then we're going to go to soft reboot and soft reboot will also get access to the APIC. Um, so here we'll init the other cores. Yeah. Um, and then soft reboot, this will take an APIC, which will be a mutable reference to an APIC. And that way we can just do APIC write ICR. And then this will get uh, core apic lock. So at this point, we, we didn't get, we're about to soft reboot. We're going to get this lock on the apic as mute unwrap. Uh, we actually got to do this. Uh, let's mute apic is equal to core apic lock. And then here we'll do apic as mute unwrap. So at this point, if an enemy comes in before we grab this lock, then uh, it's fine because we'll panic through the other path. If we get a panic, and the panic is like the last ditch effort, uh, in this case, we'll have uh, use crate apic apic. All right. So this will no longer get any locks. Yeah, soft reboot gets no more locks. And that means all locks have to be established before we go to there. And then this needs the APIC. We'll send it here. And here we're going to get the APIC. It's equal to this. And here we're going to lock the old serial port. Um, forcibly get 
access to the current APIC. Uh, this is likely safe in almost every situation as the APIC is not uh, stateful. Oops, okay. Um, then we're going to it'll be core APIC shatter. Mute deref, and then we'll uh, write to the apic. Uh, let apic is equal to this. Let apic is equal to this. We're gonna shatter. We're gonna write to that, that apic. Then we'll return the apic back out. And then at that point, we're gonna try lock on that. That doesn't matter because that can fail, and we'll just ignore it. And then in this stage, we will then pass that APIC to the soft reboot. 77, um, oh, shatter. Um, how is that an option? Oh, because it's option APIC. So that's, uh, Uh, let apic is equal to apic dot unwrap. Found an apic that gets us ownership to the apic again. We don't want that. Um, that's immutable reference to a option. So we'll do as mute unwrap. Okay. So this will, um, and at all other cores, this is uh, force, force ibly, force ibly, force, forcibly. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> okay, so now this reboot, and this uh, before it always failed, and there's the panic. Nice, because we forcibly get access to that APIC now. And that means the only dependency, the only lock that we have to be able to take, uh, actually we have no locks. At this point, we, we no longer have any locks. In the, in the entire NMI to panic path, there are no locks that we have to obtain. Um, what about unwraps? Okay, that'll panic if we don't have an APIC established, which is impossible. Um, I guess we can panic before we have an APIC set up, but that's that's not going to happen. Uh, there's no unwraps in here. Okay. Um, we have unwrap ex expect. We have no expects, no unwraps. Okay, so there's basically no more paths that a panic can occur. Um, yeah, and we're good. This will now work. And let's try it on real hardware. Z. Uh, we'll probably have to reboot that. I can't remember what state we had that in. Okay, there's the panic, and we're able to recover from it. Beautiful. Let's try it on the Phi. Okay, let's see this. Wow. Uh... <laughs> okay, so we're going to reset that phi. And let's see, is that reset? Okay, that's been reset. So here, this is working, and can this ever get stuck? And I don't think so. I don't think it's possible. The entire path from an NMI into a panic cannot fail. So this is always, this will always work. Um, nice. And then we disable that APIC when we, we drop. So we'll drop that APIC on the way out. But yeah, that, that works. Haven't seen that fail. Okay, and now we can 
get rid of this and we can go to the uh, this is the this is the timer based reset Z Z Z Z Z Z Z yep those are soft reboots okay timer and then this was obviously a bug where we could if if another core panicked and now at this point it doesn't matter at what stage of core initialization we're at uh, we'll be able to yeah, we'll be able to have those cores. Um, okay, nice. And we're fine. No problem. We're recovering every time. Fuck yeah. Panic local panic at that. Panic occurred on another core. On interrupts and then this is on more hardware. All right, I think it's safe to say this works. Nice. We, we did it. We did it. <laughs> it's, fi it's finally done. So at this stage, we can basically have a panic occur at any point, uh, and it's recoverable. Thanks for the trophy. Do you have 32 cores? This is a 256 core machine. This is a four core machine, and this is a four core VM. So, wow, wow, guys, wow. All right, so I need to refill runes on my Tibia character. I'm gonna go do that quick. Um, and uh, this will be like a tiny intermission. We'll come back, we're gonna polish up this code and then we'll push it because there's a lot of stuff we added in here. I wanna go through all the diffs. I wanna make sure everything's commented. We had a lot of debugging code. I wanna make sure all the debugging paths have been removed. Um, uh, okay, so I'm gonna go refill some, uh, refill my items on Tibia. And you guys tell me about your day. Tell me about what you're, what you're up to, how your day has been so far. And we'll use this as an opportunity to just uh, hang out for a minute while I do this. <laughs> Y'all testing on VMs, all this mad lad tests on raw 256 cores. I think it's important. It's a good stress test <laughs> that it works. <clears throat> now the really low level core of the kernel is, is, is relatively low level, but that's going to be able to use allocations and do all this sort of stuff. Oh, actually, we didn't set up, we didn't change the allocators to be NUMA aware. We enlighten them, but we don't actually use that information. So uh, we'll do that. So, and what other note do I have? Non-pub core locals. Okay, so we have some code cleanup stuff I wanna do. First thing we're gonna do is uh, NUMA. We wanna use NUMA. Um, allocations and that one's actually going to be really easy uh hi we want to go to edron yes carlin yes spent a full hour chasing a bug because i failed to reload symbols after uploading new firmware oh man what kind of firmware are you working on working on some fun hardware um, I feel like I was part of a huge milestone, but, uh, no, nothing about this topic. Hey, with the amount, with the amount that I've been banging my head on the wall in the past couple hours, I don't think you're too far behind me. <laughs> uh, can you give a quick summary of what you did when you get back? Um, yeah, so, so far what we've done is we made... I, oh, I don't even know what day it is. Um, so we made our locking infrastructure really bulletproof. Uh, and then let me do this. Um, this will be a buy 20 and backpack. Once this, yes, buy. Okay, so we made the our locking infrastructure really bulletproof. So basically, I don't know if you're around for that, um, but what we did is when a when you create a lock, you have to specify if we, if you'll ever use that lock in an interrupt. And if you will, we will assert that if that lock is ever attempted to be taken while in an interrupt, we'll panic. Not if there's a race, not if the lock's already held, but we'll just panic. So that enforces that you 
always annotate uh, interruptible, uh, non-interruptible locks. Uh, so you have to annotate all of them, and that's forced uh, at runtime, regardless of races. And then we also made it so that if you have an exception that um, you cannot use the blocking locks. This is Tibia. Yep, this is. Uh, hi, by 100 blank rune. So basically, we made it so it should be impossible to deadlock without being detected and having a nice verbose error message, which I would say is very important. Two, three, four. Uh, but yeah, so if you can use... Okay, 858, cool. Those are done. So basically, if... If you can cause an interrupt to occur, if you if you can use the lock during an interrupt, we enforce that you've annotated that. And then also, if an interrupt, if if you use a lock during an exception, so a lock that can be taken during an exception path, we require that you do not use the blocking version of lock. You use try lock, which is failable. Because otherwise, you can get in a situation where an exception occurs because we can't stop preemption on exceptions. They just come through. So we have to make sure um, that regardless of condition, uh, that you always failably access locks in any path that could be hit by an exception. Um, oops. So yeah, that's what we effectively did today. And then we fixed a couple weird bugs. Uh, and we have soft reboot working. Oh, yeah, we implemented um, we implemented NUMA awareness today, uh, which allows us to uh, walk through the ACPI tables that will detect all of the processors that are present on the system. We'll then spin up the processors one at a time. Um, uh, we also identify which processors uh, belong to which memory domains, such that we can do NUMA, which we're about to add. So we basically know given a processor we know what the nearest um we know what the nearest memory is and we'll prefer to allocate out of that memory that lo is local so we're about to plumb that through right now uh we actually wrote all the code and then we forgot to hook it up uh but that should take no more than 10 minutes uh so and right now i'm just restocking my uh, tibia character to make sure that i have Blank runes for my makers. Now I do. Grab these. I think this is an empty. That's an empty. All right, empty, empty. Just clean up my house here. All right, back to training. Um, attack this. All right, this. I'm almost out of hams. It's like a day more with the hams. Okay. Now we're back. Okay, so that was a little, small little intermission. Is there PvP in this game? There is. There's actually um, basically unfiltered PvP. Anyone can kill anyone at any time, regardless of level restrictions. And when you die, you lose 10% of what you've ever gained on your character. So if you have if you have a hundred days in game of leveling and gaining experience, you'll lose uh, ten ga ten days in game. Uh, it's a pretty brutal system, and there's really no punishment for killing someone. So yeah, uh, PvP is pretty intense in this game. It's really weird. It's more uh, leadership and uh, strategy oriented. There's not too much mechanical skill in it, but. What's the general gameplay of Tibia like? Um, you basically move your character around and you like go into you go into like caves and you fight monsters and that's about it. You just grind. You grind and you meet people and make friends and have fun. But it's uh it's a very early style MMO game where everything's very grindy. There aren't any quests. There's n there's like not much lore in the game. It's just like you're kind of in a virtual world with other people and there are monsters that you can kill and you get experience. <laughs> it's like Final Fantasy without a story. <laughs> so, okay. How do I turn off this recording, by the way? 
I never do macros in Vim, so I always forget that. And by the way, it is a gorgeous day. It is 72 degrees out. Unreal. So nice. Haha, uh -huh, okay. Hit Q again? Okay, thank you. It's like... <laughs> it's like if you made Stardew Valley into RuneScape. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, so, uh... Yeah! Reset, reset, reset. Boop, 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 boop. Okay. 256 cores, no problem. Four cores, 256 cores, I don't care. All the same to me. Nice, and we don't have to block for all the cores to be up. That's a very common thing that OS's will have. They'll require that they wait until all the cores come up, which we don't do that at all. In fact, we could actually, um, well, all the bootloader code is actually uh, blocking. Um, I, actually, what are my boot times? I, I'll plumb that through. We'll, we'll figure out what our boot times are. Uh, Okay, let's go into MM. So MM has awareness of the APIC ID to the memory range. So what we want to do is anytime that we do an allocation out of memory, which is allocate, anytime we call allocate on fizzmem, um, which is here, we want to use the allocate uh, uh, range and we need a way of failably getting our APIC identifier because we will do allocations prior to having the APIC ID set. I think prior to setting up the APIC. I don't think so. Oh, that can do an allocation prior to setting up the APIC. Okay, yes. So the answer is yes. And it's a conclusive yes, which I really like. APIC ID. Um, and this will get the current course APIC ID. Cannot be used until the APIC has been initialized. And this will be get the uh, current course APIC ID. Uh, returns none. You know, honestly, that might just be fine. If the APIC has not yet been initialized. You know, I don't think I'm re really going to use APIC ID in many spots. So here we'll just say uh, uh, if let ret is this. If ret is equal to not zero, none, else. Oh, we can match that. Hell yeah, we're rust. We can do, we can do this shit. Uh, if it's not zero, none. Everything else, uh, x at this, for everything else, return sum x. Uh, get the current AP, uh, returns none if the APIC has not yet been initialized. Oh my god, it smells so nice outside. It just smells like spring, man. Oh, it smells so good. Okay, uh, expected pattern. Oh, I can't do that. That's not zero. <laughs> Smells like allergies. Okay. Old state in ACPI, 86. Unwrap. Where else? Bring it on. 2d5. Unwrap. Okay. There we go. And that APIC ID does start out at not zero. Oh, and this doesn't have to be pub. See, that's why we have to go through and re-audit some of this code that we added. Uh, 
All right. So now in the memory manager, uh, we can use our new kernel range set, range, oh, shared range set. Source this, allocate underscore prefer. Allocate prefer, and then we'll give it a range. Noise. So, ever that we do free memory here, we get access to free memory. Here we're going to do an allocate. And we're going to do allocate prefer. And we're going to prefer to use a range specified by. Uh, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, pub fn uh, memory range. Uh, that doesn't need to be pub. Just fn. Uh, yeah, it just needs to be fn for now. And this will get the uh, preferred memory range for the currently running APIC. Returns uh, none if we have no valid uh, APIC ID yet. Or we do not yet have, um, or we do not have a, do not have domain knowledge. Yeah, if we don't have Numa knowledge of the current APIC ID. Okay. Oh, dude, I gotta like go and open up every window in my house. Bueno, uh, vamos a aprender un poco más uh, with the great Gamozo. Hell yeah. <laughs> I guess the big, the, is that the great or is that the big? <laughs> Don't do it. You'll get Corona from going outside. Yeah, how is everyone's life dealing with, uh, how is everyone dealing with uh, Corona? How is it affecting you and your, wherever your country is? I'm sure every country has a little bit different of a handling of it. It's pretty crazy that it's just a, a global thing. Like all of us are kind of uh, united by this epidemic. It's pretty interesting. Okay, um, we're gonna get the APIC ID. Um, okay, and then we're going to do if let sum, ah! and then x, this gives us an apic id, uh, apic to, uh, atmr, the apic to memory range structure, and then we're going to say, Uh, and this returns an option range. We're going to say if atmr is null, return none. Otherwise, let atmr is equal to mute deref apic to memory range unsafe. Uh, so this is check to see if the apic to memory range has been initialize and then this is the atmr uh user then programs can call the kernel by raising an interrupt uh like in 80 or syscall yeah uh what did i actually miss there um if my program calls into the kernel, is there just a single core running the kernel code or how is that working so typically when you do an interrupt uh, well, when you interrupt the kernel, which is, yep, through a syscall or an interrupt, a software interrupt, uh, like an in OX80, in OX2E, um, syscall is the common way now, which is not technically an interrupt. It's a, a different, like, trap into the kernel. Uh, but the kernel is going to potentially use many cores to service any of your interrupts. And the kernel might, uh, the kernel might see that your request is complex and it will spin up a kernel thread to handle it at a later time. It might have to queue something off and wait for a result, in which case the kernel is not going to block. Like when you have a blocking IO when you're reading from a file, the kernel is not going to block one core for that. 
it will schedule it and put it in a structure that will effectively say, when this happens, wake this thread back up and return back the syscall. So pretty much everything is based on queues and deferred operations. So pretty much a syscall typically is either going to immediately return something on that core, or it's going to store some state and re-wake the thread uh, when the data is available for that thread that the thread requested. Th those are pretty much the two common cases. Um, obviously, it can vary based on complexity and OS design and, and fundamentals, but that's pretty much universal in o all operating systems. So here we're going to uh, cast the, um, the memory range structure to something we can access. In this case, it doesn't need to be mute. We'll actually just say ATMR. And then based on our current APIC ID, look up the uh, memory range. And then in this case, we will do and then ATMR ref x. That's it, I think. Um, yeah, I think that's it. 166, let elk is equal to this. Alec prefer, we'll just say alec. We'll put this back um, just to see if this builds. Uh, 32, apic id function. And then, oh, apic id. There we go. So, and then slice indices are of u size, and we have a u32. Okay, so this is going to get the memory range. If it's null, return none. Otherwise, cast it. And then at the end, we're going to get our core, our APIC ID. If there's one, then we will look up the entry in the range database. Awesome. Nice. Okay, memory range. Um. So now, any place that we do allocate, one, two. It's two spots. <laughs> allocate prefer. And here we'll do uh, memory range. That's it. That's it. Prefer memory range. Yeah, fuck yeah, it builds. Does it work? Panic occurred on another core. Okay, so at this point, if I spin up the Xeon Phi, uh, so what we're gonna do is on the Xeon Phi, on some core, I'm gonna print, I'm gonna allocate some physical memory, uh, and I wanna see if it's different. Uh, can I actually print in that phase? In that alloc phase, can I print uh, uh, oops, this is in mm, allocate prefer, print allocated at this uh, due to range this. Yeah, allocated at this elk memory range. And this is could not satisfy from the free list. Are there no allocations or is that print just getting dropped? Let's see, let's try it on this machine. I guess if they support the X2 APIC, if there's an X2 APIC, we actually don't do any allocations yet. So let's do an allocation. Let elk is equal to uh, vec with capacity 1024. Uh, actually, we'll just do this. Well, uh, vec ox 4150 and then print the pointer of this allocation. Ah! Elk as pointer of that. Yeah, I guess that kind of makes
All right, yep, mic muted. <laughs> Sorry. I was just basically saying that uh, I'm moving around these... Uh, I'm going to do the translation of this, uh, um, and thanks for highlighting that so I saw it. Um, basically, I've moved around the... Uh, allocation to be outside of here. We had a deadlock here, which was actually really nice. The deadlock was very clear. It was uh, at MM this. We had a deadlock. I looked at that location. I saw that it was the page table lock and then took one second to think that I was doing an allocation while I had the page table locked myself. This is now going to give me the page table walk of the allocation. So we can see where it ended up putting that, um, that allocation here. We see the page is at this location. So I'm going to do translate, uh, yeah, so, um, what we should be able to do is on the phi, so we'll see, hopefully, uh, I might get rid of this, oops, not the question mark, this, this will make it a one-liner. Okay, and then I won't panic. Actually, I'll just do this on core uh, if core ID is equal to... Oh, we don't have a core 57 because we panic and bring everything down before that point. Okay, here we go. Uh, yep, here is the page table. Uh, and I probably want to... You know what? I'm just going to do this on all of them. I'm just going to print the core ID. Uh, core... APIC ID, actually, in this case. We're going to print the APIC ID. Uh, and we'll just do this on all cores. I mean, this... Oh, I should be able to handle this. Um, fuck yeah. Um, 10B... And I want to look at just the page, I think. Yeah, but it does look like we're getting slightly different ranges for these allocations. Which should be pretty good here. Um, yeah, like there's no way we're allocating that high in memory without those uh okay i do want to yeah here's what i want to do i want to print the preferred range and i can get that through mm and this is the uh memory range for the current apic So this will let us see where it wants to be, and then we'll see if it lines up with that. It might not for a couple of allocations, because there might be some things in the free list from earlier allocations that get torn down. And when those free lists are, uh, when there are pages in those free lists, it'll obviously just allocate from those. So in this case, we're going to print, uh, we're going to hex print here the mm memory range so this will print the preferred memory range um ooh can i not soft reboot this why not oh that was barked. So I probably lost this. No, I didn't. Why does this one not soft reboot? <laughs> it works on hardware, but it doesn't work in the VM. Reboot. Z. Okay, that, this. Oh, now it didn't work. Okay. All right, we got to fix something now. I, I guess it's not the last hard to debug bug. 
Um. Weird. And that's an halt. Let's disable interrupts. Translate. Then we drop those. Well, hopefully it's not a weird obscure bug. Anyways, here's the range where this wants to allocate out of. Okay, it's mm, 15. Um, huh. Okay. Let me change the alloc range. We're going to have this always return none. So I'll just always return none. And we'll see if this is the issue. No, we still can't reboot. Okay, but that's always going to give a none range. And in this case, it was always none anyways on this machine. So why is that getting stuck now? What is the possible path there to failure? Epic timers have been set. Weird. Maybe we're getting, maybe we have that EOI problem again. Core, apic, ad, uh, lock, as mute, unwrap, uh, EOI. Let's see if this one works. Okay, reboot. Okay, we can't Z that. Let's put the enable interrupts afterwards. Reset. Okay, this works. If I enable interrupts first. Reset. Weird. Um, APIC ID, memory range, translate, PMEM. Okay, let's try a normal allocation. Okay, that works. So we're fine with normal allocations. I'm going to grab the page table lock. And this is fine. Uh, get the PMEM. That should be fine. Reset. Okay. Is it really issue an issue with translate? Get the APIC ID, memory range. I think something about this print is is breaking something weird. All right, what if I just do the translate? The translate is equal to this. Uh, get rid of the print. See what happens. Okay, reset. Okay, this works. Now I'm going to print the... We'll print the elk as pointer. That's fine. Okay, and we did the translation. Print... TL, 
print the translation. Okay, so something about printing that breaks. I, I don't know why. Is that not printing the full message? It is. Okay, is it getting to here? Thank you for the sub. Jocular 8, hell yeah. Thank you for sharing with us. Absolutely, anytime. Let's try and get this working. Uh, we don't need this. And we're going to do a unsafe. We're going to print the interrupt state. I think now interrupts are somehow getting disabled. Uh, CPU flags. Right, let's take a look at this. Reset. 86. Interrupts are disabled. Print elk is pointer. Somehow, this stage is masking off interrupts, and then it never re enables them for some reason. But it's pretty obvious what's going on. Interrupts are just not getting enabled. Um. Epic timer, enable interrupts, go into here, ah, I have an idea, I wonder if in my lock, if I up interrupts, yep, oh, <gasps> Is this the reason for all of my bugs? Is this the reason for the EOI bug? Have we done it? Have we found it? We disable interrupts. And then here, we don't enable interrupts on try locks. On try locks, where there's contention of the lock, we never re-enable interrupts. I think that's it. I think that's the EOI bug, too. Clearly, that's an issue. So here, this is going to exit lock. Uh, oh, we'll do this. Um, if disables interrupts. Okay, and this is... Uh, uh, potent, uh, mark that we didn't get the lock, and thus interrupts can potentially be re-enabled. So all return paths here. Here's the return out early, return none. Disable interrupts. If it disables interrupts, then we need to exit lock. Otherwise, we'll return regardless. We're guaranteed if we don't exit here, then we will exit here, in which case it'll be entered. And then when this gets dropped, we'll release the lock and disable interrupts. That's the EOI bug. It is. It totally is. And that's why we weren't, we were, interrupts were just getting disabled. The second we tried to take a lock and then we failed uh, to attempt to take a lock, then everything breaks. And then at this stage, release the lock. If it disables interrupts, exit lock. And this, if it disables interrupts, exit lock. Oh my gosh, guys. That was a doozy. I swear to God, if this doesn't fix it. 
Okay. It does. That makes so much sense. That makes so much sense, man. That's it. That's the bug. We had we thought we fixed it with the workaround, but now we actually fixed it. And now I'm n I'm no longer concerned what it is. Thank you for the cheer. Hell yeah. That oh, so obvious, man. I don't know why that just clicked. If it disables interrupts and our lock, here we attempt to grab the lock. Here we exit lock, return none because we didn't take the lock. And then down here, we exit lock. Wow! Wow! I can't fucking believe it! Oh, dude, that explains so much of the weird oddity behavior we've been seeing. We did add that shatter, and the shatter was good, because that was on the NMI. That was, that was a legitimate fix that needed to be done. And then, but I think that's it. And now this EOI, this forced EOI thing, where the fuck that is, the APIC, we shouldn't have to do this anymore. Um, and we'll software disable the APIC. It'll cause all interrupts to get masked. That I think is, is nice to do. And then we'll software enable the APIC, set the spurious interrupts to this vector. And then we go. Okay, so now this. Yeah. Uh-oh, did that get stuck? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Do we need this? Uh-oh. Do we got more bugs here? Did we not find the root bug? Oh, this is getting stuck. God damn it. Oh god, it doesn't end. This one's actually getting stuck on the bootloader side of things. That's a new one to me. Actually, I think this is just print lagging. Because we can't reset it. I don't know if it's actually broken. We'll see. We'll see. But given the fact that we can't reset it, I think this is something's just broken on the output. I don't. I don't. I don't know if this is an, an us problem. Oh, oh, the pixie server died. Oh, oh my God. Oh, I thought, I thought we were like fucked. I thought we were in for another two hours of hell and agony and suffering. And I think we avoided it. <laughs> Oh my god. Oh. Dude, that was so oh, oh. Oh my god. Okay, does it work now? Oh. Jesus. Okay. Whew. All right, go to the APIC. Get rid of Get rid of the EOI. Now we no longer EOI things. Bam. Uh, yep. We disable the APIC. We re-enable the APIC. And let's see what we have here. Reset. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. This is good. Oh, it got stuck. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Maybe I do need that EOI. Maybe that is an unrelated thing. Let's add the EOI back in. Oh, God. 
This roller coaster. It's a roller coaster of emotions. So this is, uh, reset that, okay. All right, let's see if this gets stuck. So now we EOI that. I think that's fair, the EOI. Just make sure that's all cleaned up. Oh, I thought that got stuck for a second. Okay. I think we'll keep that, because they'll disable everything. This will software enable it. Then we EOI. Okay, and then we fix the bug in lock cell, right? Because without that in lock cell, this gets stuck. And we stop being able to interrupt it. Let's prove it. Let's prove that that is the issue. Comment that out. And this should now get stuck, and it does. Perfect. Okay, now this should not get stuck. And it doesn't get stuck. Okay, sweet. Okay. So we'll still do the EOI thing. Reset the server. I'm resetting the physical server, so yeah, we'll disable the interrupts. We'll do the EOI. Reset that server. Okay, the servers are coming back up. Oh. Okay. Trizzy! Thanks for the raid. Rust, 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 rust. <laughs> what were you streaming, Trizzy? What were you up to? Thanks for the raid. I'm about to get to... Uh, I'm about to get uh, uh, 104 axe here. <laughs> One percent of poggers. <laughs> These skills are so stupid. <laughs> oh yeah. One percent far as more. I think it's only like an hour and a half per percent or something. It's probably like an hour and 20 minutes or something per percent. The Trizzy card. Ooh. Ooh, I like that. That's some good shit. All right. That's working. We got this up on physical hardware. Yeah. Bring it on. Forty-five. Oh, this is unbiased. This will just allocate from wherever the fuck. Okay, and these look all the same, right? We see 43. I guess we see a gap to 30. All right, all right, all right. Hexprint this. This is from Marsh. Made it stay from all the Sims to throw money at Bulk <laughs> All right. Reboot. All right, so now these are in Hex. And then I think I make this, I should make the fields pub on these. Because these aren't mutable. You're not actually changing the mappings. You're just accessing the fields. Pub. What's going on? I'm so confused. We're writing an operating system here. We're writing a, an operating system from scratch in uh, Rust, which is a, a really neat programming language. That's what we do here. Okay, here we'll do uh, tl.map x, x.page. So this will only print the page, and then we'll print the address range that we want to use, and we'll do mm memory range, which should be none. And we'll print the allocation pointer. Doesn't, doesn't really matter. Okay. Reboot. All right, that's easier to read. Now we're going to change mm. To not return none, build that, reboot, okay. So here are all the allocations, and these are the requested ranges. Oh, it's not in that range. Okay, why does that not work? Yes, it's way easier to read. <laughs> now we understand. 
<laughs> Dude, how is Animal Crossing? That looks so good. It actually looks so good. Okay, so we've got this range. So this is clearly not biasing towards that range. So what's wrong with our what's what's wrong with our code? Uh, cuz that's the memory range that we'll end up trying to use. Maybe I'm just not allocating enough. If these cores do any temporary allocations during the launch time, let's let's make a bigger allocation. Let's allocate uh I don't know, let's allocate 256 megs. And then we'll check the allocation plus 200 megs. We might be in the free lists. Yeah. Doing a bunch of allocations. We can get to this flag print. Uh, physical address outside a window. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this machine has uh, too much RAM. But are these in these ranges? Hmm. They're still not allocating on other ranges, and I'm not sure why. Where do you learn all this stuff? I just been, I've been doing this for a, a long time. Just... Just playing around, having fun. It's always just been something I've enjoyed. So it's mainly just a, a, a hobby of mine. And so I just do it so much that I've just kind of gotten decent at it. Maybe. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're going to go directly to the physical allocator. We're going to do um, uh, free memory. And this will be free mem, free mem, free mem dot allocate. Uh, I forget how I do that. Allocate this. <laughs> it's already the seventeenth. Not here. Not in the. Not in the U.S. of America. Uh, we're going to allocate 4K in MM memory range. And then we'll print prefer, prefer X got X. And this will be elk is this MM. Uh, what is this? Is this called memory range or some shit? Uh, elk. Okay. All right, we'll try this. We'll see if this prints. Ah, fuck. Um, page table, page table, page table. Free mem. Get access to free memory, and then we're going to allocate some shit, and then we're going to see here. Uh, that needs to be mute. As mute. And we're going to see if it's in that range that we specified. In this case, it's none. So those are always fine. Okay, and this one, reboot. I think, oh wait, is that working? Hmm, no. Trizzy just whispered me and told me you should use Emacs instead. Nah, we're Vim users here. We use the real language. All about that Vim life. Hell yeah. Didn't didn't mean to backseat. <laughs> Damn it, Jesse. <laughs> Look, real real coders use uh edit in Windows. MS DOS edit. Okay, so why am I not allocating out of these ranges? Why is
Unless that's not in our free memory. All right, let's print free mem. Uh, where is this at? Uh, split shared. Uh, range set source. Oh, God. There we go. Alec prefer. We're going to attempt this allocation. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna panic here. Moose. I don't know if we're ever gonna hit that panic. Oh, we hit moose. Okay, so moose is a sign that this thought it allocated something in the region that was requested. So let's see if it's it, it, let's see if it's wrong. A line overlap is where it allocated, and then the range that it was going to allocate from is mm, region. Okay, that's true. That's true. That that's a thing. Uh, we'll say if region dot start is not equal to zero. So this will cause us to print in a different location. Oh, it never works for the non-zero region. <clears throat> Can you create a code that'll allow me to get a GF Gamoza? Ooh, see that's pretty difficult. How respectable is Notepad++? I'd say that's pretty respectable, to be honest. I'd like my editor to start in under 15 minutes. No Emacs for me. <laughs> Print line, GF. Oh, there you go. There you go. There's your GF right there. Um, okay, so for some reason, we never actually find an overlapping region in there. And why? Why? Poor K. I'm going to make these ranges pub. We'll pub them up. Some pub G. Uh, for range in free mem dot ranges. Print. And this is a, we'll print the free ranges here. Range. And let's see if this looks fucked. Maybe E820 has given us some shit. Okay, we got a we got a bunch of zero ranges. Um free mem in use. We'll make that pub too. And we'll make that as you size. Okay, let's see what we got here. Reboot. Oh, it's spewing. Oh god, it's so much spew. We can't reset it while it's spewing this much. What are you building? A meth lab? Ooh, not quite. Not in this case. If core ID is equal to 93. It's not an infinite loop. It's just a big loop. There's a, it's a, di there's a difference. Oh my god, that's going to print 256 times 4 times 256 lines. When will this be done? Okay, let's see. Oh, this bootloader got stuck. Oh, yeah, that does nothing. Because that doesn't have 93 cores. So this just literally does nothing. But it works. Okay. <laughs> Technically, no loop is infinite. Oh, that's some... That's deep right there. Oh, let's see if this works. Come on. Oh, why did I print so much? Mistakes were made. I don't even know how, how close it is to being done. One, two, three, four, five. It has to do that 256 times, and it'll be fine. God damn it. I feel like it'll be done faster than it would take to physically reboot this machine, which is like a minute and a half. It's kind of hard to say. <laughs> uh, 
Oh my god. Why did I do this? Ugh. And the cereal port is just busted on the cereal, cereal over land. I buffered some resets in there. They're in there. You have brick shit? Oh, I bricked plenty of stuff in my day. Brickin's where it's at. I bricked phones, routers. Never a computer. I don't think I've ever bricked a computer. Yeah, we're just gonna reset that. <laughs> All right. Uh, what if I do core ID one? So this will give an example of what this output will be. Um. Actually, why won't that boot? This one's fine. Oh, I reset the wrong server. Oh, I was like, shit, do I have a bug? No, I just reset the wrong server. Okay, so now both are reset. So this is what it'll print. It'll print all the ranges that are available for use. And then prefer non got some, and then we'll just do this on core 96. Hopefully that'll be deep enough to be on a different uh, range. <coughs> Maastrix, thanks for the Twitch Prime! Hell yeah, hope you're enjoying the content here. Maastrix! You threaten my manhood? <laughs> All these big words? <laughs> There's, there's no manhood to protect here. We're just, we're just gamers here. Oh, oh yeah. Doesn't have 96 cars. Okay. So we'll let this server come up. Oh yeah. 1.3 gigahertz. Who needs faster cores? <laughs> This is the real gamer computer right here. <laughs> there we go. So these are the ranges in memory. Okay. That means, that means there's a bug in Whatever we wrote. Wait, is that in the range? No, it's not. So we didn't get an allocation in the preferred range. So we have, okay. So here we have a concrete example of a bug. And we need to figure out why this doesn't work. Um. So this should be able to find, that's at least two FPS in Minecraft. I don't even know if that server could play Minecraft. It would be, it would be painful. Um, prefer. So we do an allocate prefer. We got a region. That's sum. We then check if the entry that we're currently on overlaps with the region. If it does, which it does, right? This overlaps with this. Wait, does it? Yeah. Um, okay, here I'm going to panic. I'm going to panic with the overlap. Overlap is X. We'll print the overlap. Oh my god, I'm stupid. Uh, overlap. <laughs> there we go. And... Is that true? Oh yeah, that's saying there's 100% overlap. 
The whole thing's overlap. Okay. Then. Oh, shit. I think these are wrong. A line mask is already minus one. No. A line minus one. Wrapping at that. And then we don't get to this stage? Question mark? That'd do it. So we're not getting there. Okay. Uh, and we'll print this. A line mask. What what am I what am I doing wrong? It's clearly obvious. So we take FFF. We've got overlap. Panic on another core. Um Okay, so we have a line mask. Yeah, the overlap. So this is the overlap, and that makes sense because it's it's the whole fucking range is overlap. Sweet. Um If the align overlap, oh, is greater than or equal to start. Align mask can be, that can, yeah, if it's aligned, that's the bug. It's done. We fixed it. It's done. Game over. GG. GG. Well played. Here's the panic. Moose. We hit the moose panic. It, the moose panic means we did it. So we'll undo everything that we did, and then we'll change this to an equals. And then we're fine. And then this align overlap is less than or equal to the end. And that's for the size. And then ranges is not pub anymore. Oh, my God. OK, here we go. Alec prefer in that range. And there we go. Yeah, it allocated in the preferred range. Nice. Nice. And now why does it get like a somewhat random address? Because it should. Oh, I guess other things are getting allocated out of there. How much is that? How much is that allocated? That ain't too much. Okay. Oh, we allocate a meg. That's why. If we get rid of that meg allocation. There we go. E4. Yeah, we get right at the base. And then the next allocation that we get, we'll do another allocation from that range. And we'll get a 1,000. Nice. Fuck yeah. So now we have a NUMA-based allocator, and now we'll, we'll, we'll switch to a different core. We'll go to 32 instead. Uh, that has the same range. Okay, uh, 50. We just got to find a core with a different range. Okay, here's one with a different range. This was the range, and we got an allocation in the range. Woo! Woo! NUMA local! Yee yee! All right. I think we did it, guys. We did it. <clears throat> Reset. Bring all those cores up. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Um What what happened? What happened? What happened? We change that, print core ID. Uh oh. Why did that get stuck? Does this one get stuck? No. That doesn't get stuck. Okay. 
Reset the server. We'll see what that is. Uh-oh. Uh, we got this in here. Okay, that's good. Yikes. Do we start drinking now? Oh, yeah, we're always drinking. Huh. Uh, okay, so why is that getting stuck? Shouldn't be the case. Do we have some like weird? No. What did we, what were we doing? We did this. Yeah, that should be fine. Well, okay, all the cores up, reset. Huh. I don't know what that bug was. It's kind of hard to say. Seems to be working now. It seems to be. So this broke something? Because this is what we were running. We were running this. Oh, that got stuck. Okay. That's nice to know. Is that not releasing free memory or something? Well... This can get the free mem lock. Oh yeah, let me try this with one. Let's see if this uh, this should repro in this. No. There. Oh, damn it. Uh, I think it's something about getting this free memory lock while something's coming up. Hmm. Weird, weird. If I panic, we should be able to recover. Foop. We'll panic here. We should be able to recover from a panic. Um, and I guess, yep, there's the panics and then we'll see. Hey, advance in ax fighting, 104, hell yeah. Reset. Um, God damn. I don't know why that's getting stuck. I think this, this should always succeed. This should always survive. Uh, let's check out, let's check up our interrupt stack. We could potentially disable interrupts, but we're not doing that on the zeroth core. So interrupts are enabled on the zeroth core. We come through, enter interrupt, enter exception. That's for NMIs. If we can't get the interrupt lock, we won't be able to dispatch, which means we won't EOI. Ah, that's a possibility. If we fail to get this interrupt lock, that can happen if we're setting up interrupts on our current core, which is not going to be the case because they're set up. So 
So this has the panic. And panic we can always recover from. Ah. I think we do want to panic here. Try lock this. Uh, try to get the dispatch handler for this exception. Uh, this will be a panic condition. Expect failed to uh, uh, get interrupts lock. And that's fine. That'll promote this into a panic. As ref, expect get the dispatch number off of this. Um, we just need to we need to make the interrupt path a little bit more bulletproof. So we know that this is bulletproof, this panic path, and this path try lock to get the interrupt lock. Azref expect fail to get interrupt lock. Uh, actually expect dot azref incorrect closing delimiter. Okay, okay, where where. Oh, we don't need that at all. No dispatch on. And that is, that unwrap is if interrupts are not set. Okay, then here, we will go into the handler, and the handler will execute. So if we cannot execute the handler, we will panic. So if we can't get access to interrupts such that we can go into the handler, and then let's look at the handler then. Now we can have panics because we can always uh, kind of pa panics we can always kind of break out of and survive. So if we can't get a lock in one of these phases, um, boop. This is going to go into the handler. The only handler we currently have is a CPI, which is timer um, or interrupt. Oh, that's an APIC. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Here we go. Uh, oops. Timer interrupt. Uh, here we'll try to get the APIC lock. Um, try lock. Unwrap. Uh, expect failed to get APIC lock during uh, timer interrupt. Fatal. As ref, uh, as mute, EOI, uh, unwrap, EOI. Okay, and then attempt soft reboot. That's going to get access to the serial port, I think. Yeah. So try lock. If we fail to get the lock, then we panic. And then in interrupts. Or in panic, attempt soft reboot. Here, if we if we fail any of this stuff, we just need to make sure the EOI happens. So make sure the EOI happens. The rest of the stuff can can be wishy washy. Okay, here we go. Get rid of the panic. This is now back to what previously did not work. Oh, it's stuck. What the fuck? Wait. It rebooted. Z. It doesn't get stuck anymore. But it's not panicking either. Interesting. Oh. Oh, uh, it looked like it was stuck, but it wasn't. Okay. So, basically... Attempt soft reboot, that doesn't matter. And then these, try lock, only if we can do it. Map that stuff, flatten that down. Uh, attempt to get a byte from the serial port. Then here we'll uh, get the APIC lock. And that's in a soft reboot. If that's a deadlock, we'll get a panic. Okay. 
Well, I think whatever it was, we fixed it. I don't really understand how, because that trilock should still be failing, and we should be getting an expect. We didn't really change any semantics. Oop. Ah, it was just delayed. Okay. All right. Z. Okay, so it works on that hardware. Works on this hardware, or that virtual machine. And this hardware, just fine. Okay. And what do we have? We did it we did at 50. So we'll try 50. We know 50 broke. Z. Oh. Okay, 50 breaks. Why though? Of course, check in. Ooh. So on that 50 core, a bunch of other cores came up, enabled interrupts. We get the free mem lock. This should release the free mem lock. Deadlock, if that deadlocks. Um, yeah, okay, we gotta figure this out. God damn it, man, these bugs are killing me. These are brutal. What is this? Uh, yeah, I reset that session. There we go. Um, what? What? Uh, deactivate. Yeah, we'll do this. Um, in this fifty case, we have we we got a problem. But I shouldn't be able to break anything. I don't think the zeroth core is still we're still sitting bringing up cores when that happens. So that comes through. We're still setting up setting up cores. This done does some prints. And I guess that gets a lock. Okay, let's see here. Hmm. Hmm. That's still rebooting? What's going on here? Reset server. Okay. So, what can happen here? The other core is starting up and is an ACPI init. And ACPI init is 
that is currently spinning up the other Apex right here. Set the course date to launched. Wait for it to come online. Oh! We launch a core and it never comes online. Okay. While the core state for the APIC ID is not online. And that happens if they don't check in. And they won't check in if... I'm guessing this is grabbing free mem, which is then preventing... Oh, does core locals allocate? I think it does. Oh my god, I got I think I got it. Core locals gets free memory. It locks that. So what happens here is the cores come up, the 50th one snags the free memory lock. This comes and grabs the free memory lock. Um And what's going on here? Then we get access to physical memory. Allocate. We basically, we can't panic in this phase. And I think that's what's happening. Um. Server's not happy though. It's not coming up. Let's see if I can force it off. So, lock the physical memory allocator. That's fine. Should be. Let's just off, turn on the server. So, you get that physmem here. Free mem here. Here we grab the free mem lock on another core. We block on that because it's held here. Here we grab a lock on the serial port. Um, oh, that's really interesting. So the... Allocate prefer, okay, so free mem, we got the free mem lock and then we print while we have the free mem lock That's going to do an allocate. Um, get the boot args. Um, PMM lock. Here I can do a core, um, core mem drop PMM. I should be able to drop PMM at this phase. Okay. I don't know why the serial overland is, is borked. I think the serial over LAN is just is just borked. I might have to reset the BMC. Hey. Okay. So this I should be able to reboot. Reboot, 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 reboot. Okay. And 
The problem is we wait for those cores to come online. Do we have to do that though? Doesn't matter. Do we have a global lock on anything? I don't think so. So I'm gonna get rid of that. I'm just gonna let it swoosh by. And this is fine. We don't have to actually wait for them to come online. Then we should be able to add this back in. There we have the reboots working. Okay. And there we just basically bring all the cores up. And this will bring them all up in a predictable order. But if we do this, we're waiting for them to come online. And if one doesn't come online, Reserve early st release early stack, that's easy. Just write that fizz. Init core locals. That gets this PMEM. Drop that. We'll do this. I'll let core local pointer is equal to this. Let's just scope this in a bit, but I think there's still an issue. Allocate the core locals, okay. I guarantee that the lock will get dropped. Get rid of the semi. Okay, I think this will get stuck. It does, okay. So that gets stuck. A core's not coming online. We we boot up a core and it's just not coming up. But al almost 24 hours at this point? Yeah, pretty close, I think. Been streaming for so long. I was watching it earlier at like 11 or noon Eastern. Hell yeah. Huh. All right, let's reboot this box because we horked it. I can get rid of this where I don't wait for the cores to come online and I just boot them up. Uh, while online. If I block, this gets the free mem. I guess we use free mem all over in the bootloader. Maybe something's deadlocking in the bootloader. Some like it tries to allocate its stack and the lock is held here, but this should release the lock. It should just block in the bootloader until this is done. Uh, don't want to start ourselves. Mark the core is launched. Launch the core. Dude, I don't know why that's... So this works. But if I get stuck here, if I have the APIC lock, interrupts are disabled. Um, waiting for the cores, and the cores aren't coming online. Why? They knit their locals, and knit their interrupts. Um, no, this is correct. They're not equal to online. Um, well, 
Why would why would that be a thing? There's some like really weird interaction here that I'm not seeing. We don't we're not holding any locks, are we here? Shouldn't. Lock. We have an APIC lock on ourselves. That's it. Nothing else. Well, we allocate. Well, that's fine. The, it, everything's single-threaded until here. At this stage, we launch cores. They come up. And then, for some reason, this is causing a core to not come up. And that could be in the bootloader. That could be in so many different places that a core is not launching. Uh, what? So we've got... While the core is not online, well, we can't do that right now. Let's let's see if all the cores are coming up. Core online. And that's when, yep, that's 50. 50 came online and then printed these ranges. Um, we'll do static cores booted atomic U size is equal to atomic U size new zero cores uh, booted is equal to cores booted dot fetch add one ordering sequentially consistent and we're going to print this. Uh, use core sync atomic star. Fuck it. Uh, new zero. So as all the cores come up, we'll see those numbers. 171. Oh. Wait, these are just printing out in different orders. Yeah, I think all the cores are coming up. Um, and we'll say if booted is equal to 255, then we'll print this. That's the last one. Wow. We'll say if booted is greater than 250... Slash R doesn't help here because I wouldn't be able to see the messages. 255. 255. Oh, yeah, those numbers will be nearly identical. <gasps> okay, in this case, we didn't have that. Okay, sometimes the cores aren't coming up. Um, I think I need a delay. If core 255 started, yes, yes, it does guarantee uh, all of them would be booted. So sometimes we're just seeing all of them not come up, and that's because uh, there needs to be a delay in the init sippy sippy. Um, I think the manual says uh, sippy sippy. Um, creates the ACPI table, blah, blah, blah. Load the, that's the broadcast and knit sippy sippy to the APs to wake them and initialize them. Um, if software knows how many logical processors it expects to wake up, it may choose to pull the count variable. <clears throat> may choose to pull a count variable. 
If the expected processors show up before the 100 millisecond time, the timer can be canceled and skipped to step 16. AP sequence. Identifying, read the APIC ID, use the table from the ACPI table. Um, I think you're supposed to put a delay. Yeah, 10 millisecond delay loop. So broad init IPI to all. That's C4500. 10 millisecond delay loop. Load the ICR with the SIP EIP. And that, when the count is known, 10 second loop. And it all broadcast the SIPI to all APs. 200 microsecond delay loop to see if count has been reached. If you know the count. In this case, yeah, I need a delay. So that's what I need. Um, we're going to do uh, SP uh, shared source. Uh, hmm. Yeah, shared. Uh, how do I want to do this? We're going to go into shared CPU source. We're going to go here. Pub FN delay cycles. I cannot use thread. Asm r this move racks zero to uh, two deck racks j and z short jump non zero short uh, to two b. Uh, if not cycles return. Oops, it's, this isn't C. If cycles is uh, less than or equal to zero, return. Otherwise, we're going to have an input into a register. This is going to be cycles. Uh, and this is a busy, this is just a um, busy delay loop. Okay, we load zero into racks, deck racks, jump not zero, shorts. Or, well, it'll make it short. And then we clobber racks. Do a memory clobber. CC clobber. Volatile and Intel. So it's just a busy loop for that many cycles. Load the cycles into racks. Deck racks. Jump not zero. Racks memory CC as clobbers. Okay. Uh, and that's unsafe. Boom. Okay, so now I can do a delay, a CPU delay. We'll do a million cycles. See what we got here. Oh, and it got stuck. Oh, because we put this while loop back in here. Okay, so... Basically, we have cores not coming up, so this is actually a real, a real-ish issue, which is actually pretty neat. So the issue is not a lock or anything like that, which is great because I was concerned something was wrong with my model. Um, so we'll do a nit sippy sippy, and this says a ten millisecond delay loop.
And if it fails to bring it up, it just tries again. Go to step 16. So I think that's probably what I need. Um, so that delay, what did they say? 10 milliseconds? That's insane. That's such a large amount of time. There's no way. Ten milliseconds is unreal. Do we have to understand the CPU you, speed of the CPU to get that? And we kind of do. Um, it yeah, kind of do. Unfortunately, uh, did we not rebuild that? How many delays is this doing? Two, 256. Did we boot that into a bricked environment? I think I did. Uh, okay. We're gonna get rid of this, this whole thing. We, we know what the issue is. Cores are not coming up. Oof. And we'll put these delays up. Init, we'll init it twice. But yeah, we've got cores that just aren't coming up. Does that break down the cores that have a variable rate clock? Um, yeah, it's kind of a pain. So we're gonna eventually calibrate the RDTSC to figure out the wall clock speed of the RDTSC. Um, we don't have that yet, but we should be able to get by without it. We, we won't need to sleep for a specific amount of time in this case. Okay, so that's starting. Z. Is that just taking that long? Four, five, six, ten million. Ten million times... Four times two fifty six. Oh, that's a big number. This is a set. This is eight seconds of delay. And there's the cores. We did get all of them. Let's do this. Let's drop it down to a million. Z. There's everything. Okay. Uh. I think we're gonna init all but self. So this will be init all but self. We'll delay for a large amount of time, uh, in which case on a 10 milliseconds uh, is 0.01 seconds. Let's say on a five gigahertz processor, which is like worst case, it's 50 million cycles. So that'll wait for basically as if it's a, f a five gigahertz processor. Um, and this will do a, we wanna directly write this to the APIC. This is gonna be a um, write ICR, yeah. Write ICR, and it all but self, C45, okay. And then we're going to launch the cores. 
Sippy Sippy. Okay, let's see what we got. All the cores. All the cores. All the cores. So it might not be them having problems coming up after a knit. Maybe it's a problem with this, where ones get they're getting stuck in the bootloader somehow. Nope, they're all up. All up. Nope. Not in this case. Okay, so there are some cases where the cores aren't coming up. And I guess... Yeah... I'm going to add a delay here of a couple hundred micros. We're going to add another init all but self. Nope. Um, and this one's stuck. How is this stuck? It shouldn't be. Right, ICR. Delay. Write that. Then here, 4608. Maybe they're getting stuck in the bootloader somewhere. I should be able to panic in the bootloader. Well, if I panic on a core... Yeah, maybe they're panicking the bootloader? But I would expect to see the bootloader panic message in that case. Um, yeah, that would go into panic and then... Okay, what do we do in the bootloader panic? I bet they're panicking in the bootloader for some reason. Panic. Okay. We get the serial lock, and then we print panic in bootloader. CPU halt. But here I'm not waiting for them. So it shouldn't matter. Oh, unless these... Panic with that lock held. Hmm. What's the AP entry path? Source. Main. All right, what's, it's gonna come in here, it's gonna lock the serial driver. If it's none, it's gonna release it. Uh, something to do with this, the free mem here. Store the soft reboot information. Initialize the, initialize the MMU. And that will init. If it's sum, it'll do nothing. So it'll get that and it'll return out. Okay. Grab locks on these. 
If that's none. If the kernel entry is none, okay. Otherwise, get the free memory lock. Get the free memory lock. Uh, that point, page will set up. Allocate a unique stack address for the core. Fetch add. Map in the stack. Hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think I'm going to wrap it up for here. <clears throat> I'll probably finish this one offline, figure this out. But I got to get some sleep. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Hope you had a blast. More exciting dev to come soon. I'll probably iron out some of these bugs and polish up the documentation and do some of the boring stuff. Uh, make sure we're ready to do um, network development. So, see you all around. Thanks for tuning in.